Deputy. My name is City Councilor at Large Michael Flaherty, Chair of the Government Operations Committee, and we are here today to discuss Docket 0315. It's an ordinance establishing equitable regulation of the cannabis industry in Boston. This matter was sponsored by my colleague to my left, City Councilor Kim Janey, referred to the Committee on Government Operations back on February the 6th. This proposed ordinance seeks to ensure equitable regulation of the cannabis industry. The ordinance seeks to create Boston Cannabis Board and the Boston Equity Program, and in doing so, the proposal looks to establish the qualifying criteria for equity applicants. The proposed ordinance additionally outlines application requirements for all cannabis establishment applicants, the criteria for licensing, fees, and enforcement powers, among other things. As Chair, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that this hearing is not an opportunity to discuss the legalization of marijuana cannabis. That debate has already happened, and the results were at the ballot box on November the 8th, 2016. The purpose of this hearing is to specifically discuss Docket 0315. Today we'll have three panels, and I anticipate a lot of people looking to submit public testimony. And as Chair, it's my responsibility to ensure this hearing runs as close to one time as possible because of hearings that are scheduled a little later on today. So I'll have to be kind of keeping an eye on the clock and enforcing time limits if possible. I'd also like to note that this hearing is being streamlined on Boston City Council TV online. It's also being recorded and will be broadcast at a later date on Comcast Channel 8, RCN Channel 82, and Verizon 1964. Um, before I turn it over to the lead sponsor, I would just like to read into the record a letter from our colleague and City Council President, Andrea Campbell. Dear colleagues, regrettably, I'm unable to attend today's hearing on Docket 0315. Uh, I, thank, I thank Councilor Janey for her, her work creating this important ordinance, and I look forward to working with her and my colleagues on next steps to ensure equity in this industry, and we'll be reviewing all of the written, submitted materials, and we'll review the tapes and public testimony. Sincerely, uh, Andrea Campbell, President of the Boston City Council. I also want to recognize a couple former colleagues that are in the audience. I know that I saw Councilor Tito Jackson is here. Where did Tito Jackson go? Tito's over here. I know a co colleague in government, a former state senator from East Boston, Anthony Petricelli is here. I saw Anthony as well. And a former colleague who also will be uh, leading the first panel is city former city council Michael Ross. So we're also joined here uh, by, uh, in order of their arrival, uh, Councilor Ed Flynn, Councilor Josh Zakem, Councilor Frank Baker, Councilor Mark Siomo. And with that, I'll turn it over to the lead sponsor, City Councilor Kim Janey. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank everyone for coming this morning. I especially uh, want to thank our panelists and all of the activists, entrepreneurs, and residents who have been involved in this conversation from the very beginning. Your input has been very useful and important in developing this ordinance. I also want to thank uh, the administration for engaging in this conversation about the need for greater equity. I hope that we will be able to work in partnership and pass and implement this legislation. As I've said before, this industry is here um, and it has already generated $54 million across the Commonwealth since sales began in November. 62% of Boston voters supported legalization, as the chairman has already noted, uh, as, as well as the majority of the Commonwealth. The question now becomes who will benefit? Who will have the capital and techn technical know-how to get into the industry? Will it be those who are harmed by the war on drugs, or it will be those who had a head start? Will it be local businesses, or will it be large firms from out of state? We have heard repeatedly the need for clarity on the local approval process, the need for capital and business development resources to be available, and the need for greater intentional focus on equity in supporting those who have been most harmed by the war on drugs. With this ordinance, we have the opportunity to accomplish these goals. We can establish fairness, equity, and justice in this rapidly emerging industry. If the people and communities that have been locked up during prohibition of cannabis are now locked out from meaningful participation in this industry, then we will have missed this important opportunity to correct injustices of the past. I believe that creating a city-level equity program is critical to ensuring that we do this right, creating a two-year period of priority for equity applicants to give them a chance to establish themselves and establishing a two-to-one ratio for equity cannabis businesses to non-equity cannabis businesses will make sure that equity remains a central focus of the cannabis regulation in both the short term and the long term. While the equity program is crucially important, it is not the only thing accomplished by this ordinance. We would create a board, adding more public accountability into the process. People with experience in public health, public safety, and economic development will be able to 
uh, take part in the board as well as someone formerly incarcerated for cannabis use to make sure that those closest to the pain are closest to the power, as our former colleague and esteemed Congresswoman says. This ordinance promotes transparency by officially setting out criteria for the review of applications by the board and creating a public registry to make sure that information about applicants and businesses is accessible to the public. To address the ban on federal funds and supporting anything related to cannabis, the ordinance would direct all fees and taxes collected to a specific fund to create the equity program to pay the board for the board's operations and for small business development in communities disproportionately impacted. In conclusion, this ordinance ensures equity, clarity, transparency, and accountability. Thank you again for being here, and I look forward to a productive hearing. Thank you very much, uh, Kim. Uh, do my colleagues, any other colleagues have an opening? Uh, Councilor Flynn. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to Councilor Janey for her leadership on this important issue. Um, had an opportunity to attend several of the um, working sessions recently and learned a lot um, from, from many people that are interested in, the, in this field. But what I learned mostly was you know, because the because it's a lot of banks will not fund um, this industry. Um, it's a huge disadvantage to um, small business owners that don't have the capital to um, pursue this um, new industry. And I I agree with Councillor Janey. I'd love to see some type of program where if you were awarded a license that a certain percentage or a certain fee would go into a, a bank that could help fund um, small business owners in the communities of color or women-owned businesses so that they can have the capital necessary to open a business. So I think it's almost a responsibility for people that do have a license to make sure that you know, communities of color also benefit in this growing industry and women-owned businesses also are able to participate in this new industry as well. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm looking forward to hearing about is how, how we can make sure that capital is available to potentially women-owned businesses and um, businesses owned by those in the communities of color and veteran-owned businesses as well. So I'm looking forward to learning more about um, how we can do this. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council Flynn. Chair recognizes Councilor Zakem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I want to thank uh, our good colleague, Councilor Janey, for not only drafting um, this thoughtful um, and expansive piece of legislation, it's incredibly important uh, that Boston lead on the issue of equity when it comes to this new industry. Uh, as I said, when, we when this bill was introduced, this is a unique opportunity uh, in the city of Boston and across the Commonwealth, but we'll focus on what we can do here in the city of Boston to work to address longstanding issues of equity in our society. Very f uh, seldom, and I would say probably back 100 years now, was the last time a previously illegal industry uh, was open and regulated in this country. We have an important opportunity to do this right, and we need to act fairly quickly here, as we know that people across the country uh, and across the Commonwealth are coming here uh, to the city of Boston to open these dispensaries. I think hardly a week goes by where another applicant does not uh, talk about opening one in District 8, uh, which I represent, and that's great. I love to see the energy around this, but we need to be thoughtful, we need to be deliberate, and that includes setting up a system of predictability for all applicants, but also making sure we can we do what we can, what we have been uniquely granted through this state law to make real strides towards equity uh, in this industry. Not just in this industry, but the dollars and $54 million in just a few months uh, is outstanding. What's going to happen in Boston is going to be many times that, and we need to make sure we are really being deliberate about how that benefit gets spread most widely so it can address some of the injustices and inequities uh, in our society for generations. So I look forward to hearing from experts, including my predecessor uh, on this body, Mike Ross, um, and others here in the audience. It's incredibly important. I want to thank, uh, again, Councilor Janey for doing this. It's not an easy bill to draft, uh, to file, to bring forward. And, uh, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing. Thank you very much. Councilor Sioma, any opening comments? 
to Council Baker, any opening comments? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Beautiful. Chairman. Council Janey, thank you for your legislation here. Um, I'm glad that we're talking about this subject, but I think we need to broaden what we talk about when, when we're here, because to talk about um, you know, lifting communities up, communities aren't going to be lifted up by dispensaries. Dispensaries are going to be basically more, you know, if you equate them with liquor stores. I think we should be talking about, in conjunction with this, um, with this talk here is how do we create green zones and, and, and within those green zones, the auxiliary businesses that are happening because of the marijuana industry, whether if it's grows or manufacturing, how do we, how do we um, get all those businesses here to our, to our communities that could benefit from them? Um, and again, I look forward to the, to the talk where we end up with this. Uh, one thing that should happen in those, those green zones, I think we need to start talking about consumption cafes. A consumption cafe can really drive an economy if we're, if we're open to it, if communities are open to it in, within these green zones. Because um, if we had a, when we went to Denver, they were promoting Denver as a green destination, and there was no, there's no place to smoke. It's not a green destination if you can't if you can't smoke comfortably like an adult. Um, so those are some of the things we should be open to. Consumption cafes would drive a restaurant economy, would drive, would, would get people on the street and spend in dollars in areas that could use it. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Baker. We've also been joined by our colleague, City Councilor Michelle Wu, who's waving. So uh, good morning, uh, Michael, and welcome. Uh, Attorney Michael Ross, if you could just state your name and affiliation for the record. And uh, I've, uh, <clears throat> on behalf of my colleagues, I'd ask that you come in and present uh, first. I know you have a PowerPoint presentation and uh, to sort of help frame kind of what the city's looking to do, what the state allows, what this ordinance is looking to do, what other cities are looking to do. So I know that you've uh, got a presentation that kind of capitulates all of that. Uh, so well, welcome. Thank you for putting the time and effort into this. And you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Good morning, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman. And uh, good morning, uh, Councillor Janey and uh, members of the uh, City Council. It's great to, always great to be here and great to be back. Um, you've asked me, Mr. Chair, uh, to, to be here in my capacity as a former city councilor uh, and as an active attorney practicing within the cannabis industry to provide testimony to the committee so that it may help with your deliberations. Uh, my colleagues and I at Prince Lobel have been working with and interpreting the various state and local statutes, ordinances, and regulations relating to cannabis since the industry arrived in Massachusetts. And I think I can help provide some informed observations as you consider the implementation of new policies for Boston, as well as offer some recommendations that the council may want to consider. Uh, let me start with the very legitimate reason for this ordinance in the first place, the obvious lack of diversity within the industry. Uh, at the state level, it's important to point out that the economic empowerment application period only lasted for two weeks. Um, that period was from April 2nd to April 16th of 2018. If you happen to apply during that period, you would be considered as an economic empowerment uh, applicant. And of those applicants during that two week period, only 123 people were certified as applicants. So to start, the state pool was extremely low. It's no longer open. Uh, and people are not eligible today to apply to become econ economic empowerment applicants. That's why the work that you're doing here and other cities are doing here is so important. Because in lieu of this program at the state level, it's important for cities to step up and create their own programs. And cities have been stepping up to create their own programs. This is the city of Somerville's ordinance, which provides priority applications, applicants uh, access to the program in the event they are an economic empowerment applicant, but also in the event that they meet the criteria of an economic empowerment applicant, because, of course, there's only those 123 people. So this is Somerville's ordinance. This is your ordinance right here. This is the criteria that you are um, basing applicants to be part of the um, Boston Equity Program. And in your flip charts, I don't have all the slides because uh, I put the relevant ones in there. I, I just, we can follow along the screen, but I also gave you uh, some print out of that. 
So what I did here is I compared the Boston equity uh, applicant criteria next to, that's on the left, on the right is the state criteria. The Boston criteria has choosing three of five criteria. The state criteria says choose three of six criteria. Now some of these criteria line up uh, directly. So for example, the majority ownership belong to people who've lived uh, for in a dis area of disproportionate impact, as well as obviously the majority impact of indi individuals being black, African American, Hispanic, or Latino. Those come directly from the state ordinance, I mean from the state uh, ec economic empowerment uh, application, and they're on your proposed ordinance that's in front of you today. The other items come from a different state program called the Social Equity Program. This is a program that is in effect today. It provides assistance and fee relief and other benefits for economic empowerment applicants, and those criteria ha have also um, uh, made their way into the criteria of the boss, proposed Boston Ordinance. And you know, basically they are, in addition, is the uh, uh, household income below 400% of federal poverty level, and then a uh, person who's been convicted of possession or sale of trafficking in, 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 or of a marijuana uh, drug crime. And let me just point out, that's a conviction, not an arrest. Then there are these remaining, that I highlighted in green, uh, items to the right that are still part of the uh, Cannabis Control Commission economic empowerment applicant criteria that did not make their way into the Boston uh, ordinance. And those are, uh, you know, that the majority ownership is comprised of people who've been service, serving the communities of disproportionate impact, that 51% of employees or subcontractors live in areas of disproportionate impact, that the employees or subcontractors have drug-related quarries, and then another a catch-all uh, item right there as well. So my first recommendation to the council would be to consider whether or not you want to include any of these additional criteria that are in the state uh, legislation. Let me just unpack this issue of area of disproportionate impact. To find out what an area of disproportionate impact is, you go to the CCC's uh, website and it lists all these census tracts. And listed like this, it's almost impossible for you to appreciate what that looks like. And so over the weekend, I mapped these census tracts to a map for the city of Boston. And this is actually what it looks like. Um, you can see that this is the official areas of disproportionate impact uh, as identified by the CCC. But right away, you might notice some things here that, that don't make a lot of sense. Uh, first and foremost, there's the Harbor Islands, uh, the uh, Franklin Park, Mount Hope Cemetery, the Boston Common, the Public Garden, the Muddy River, uh, Harvard University Business School, and the highway over there. All of those areas have been included within this area of disproportionate impact. Now, clearly, that's probably not uh, an appropriate map. And so I just pulled them off that map. And let me just say, there's no one uh, more, uh, I think, prepared to handle identifying these areas than the people in this room, you, the city councilors, and uh, representatives of the mayor's office to identify this map. So I'd encourage you to think about this map and make sure you get it right uh, in the ordinance. You also might want to include uh, median income thresholds and take a look at areas that are below median income and include that within the map. Um, if I overlay those census tracts on top of the areas of median income, you'll find that there are a few areas that are actually in areas of above median income those three census tracts. I don't think you necessarily do or want that in there, so I just remove those right there. Uh, the purple represents areas below, the green represents areas above. So then there are areas of obvious, um, that are well below areas of median income, and I identified them there. So, you know, in the end, the map that you come up with may very well look different than the current map that's on the, sec the, um, the state, um, the state, um, website. So that's another recommendation is you may want to expand the map um, and, and take a look at that. Um, there are, there's other criteria here that you might want to look at. Um, personally, I represent some um, uh, clients who are uh, coming out of uh, Dorchester, Vietnamese Dorchester and, uh, chi and Chinatown, um, while not um, you know, necessarily uh, the target of the war on drugs here in Boston. Um, you know, there may or may not be data that you want to look at. 
as how the Asian community and those communities were affected by the war on drugs. So you might want to consider uh, adding Asian uh, persons to that criteria. Um, here, this is um, the language of the ordinance includes the uh, a grandfathering language so that if you had applied before February 1, you're not within this uh, ordinance. I think that's good public policy. You have to do that. It has to comply with law. I would just point out that there are the application process that exists today, the filing with the Office of Emerging Technologies, was not the application process that, exert, that existed for a number of applicants before that was put in place. Uh, for example, this is a, a letter from the Boston city, the clerk reflecting the city council's vote on a letter of non-opposition. I would suggest that any letters of non-opposition that the city council have issued should certainly be grandfathered by this ordinance and any, um, any other criteria to open, such as host community agreements or other necessary criteria to open, should be afforded to them. So that's another recommendation grandfathered the early applicants, especially those that were approved by this body. And to that matter, there's state legislation. I don't want to get into the weeds on this. This is Chapter 94G, Section 3A1I. And just basically what this says is that if someone was an existing medical operation in your community, uh, no ordinance can prevent that existing uh, medical operator from converting, unless for some reason they've made other uh, agreements to, to that. Uh, but by ordinance, it cannot prevent someone from making that conversion. So I would, I would recommend that this fully complies with state law, this ordinance. Um, this, and then, I, you know, as you always do in this body, you look at other cities and states for their, for their, for maybe some guidance. This is the um, Office of Cannabis from San Francisco. They have some things that are unique to their office. If you own at least 40% of the business uh, and are the CEO of the company, then uh, you're, you're eligible for the, for the equity application. Uh, you, the council might want to consider expanding those definitions. Also, they, um, they have people who are arrested, not just conviction, convicted. Sometimes people are arrested, they lose their homes, they get thrown out of schools, they get thrown out of their jobs. Sometimes being arrested can be uh, almost as bad as being convicted. Um, and so, you know, it's something that, that San Francisco has included in their ordinance. It's something you might want to look at. And then you have a lot of communities in Boston that have been gentrified. Um, San Francisco went all the way back to 1971 to look at those communities. For example, Mission Hill is not an area of disproportionate impact, but there are people who have lived for generations in Mission Hill within that area. You might want to expand that as well. Um, I'm rounding third and heading home here. Uh, this is the city of Cambridge right here, and something that they did that was interesting, they have a buffer zone similar to the half-mile buffer zone that you, Mr. Chair, were very active in creating, but they allow equity applicants, and you see they also al allow social equity applicants. We saw that earlier. They allow both of those eligible applicants to permeate that buffer within that 1,800. That might be something. Can you repeat that, Michael? So the city of Cambridge has an 1,800-foot buffer uh, within uh, their ordinance, uh, everyone must comply with it. However, if you are an equity applicant or a social equity applicant, you can go within that buffer. That's the city of Cambridge. Um, so that's a recommendation. You might want to consider additional advantages for equity applicants, for social equity applicants, or for the people you're deeming as equity applicants. This is the city of Somerville again. I showed it to you earlier. This one says that you only need one of the criteria to comply with this priority application. For Somerville, they said if it's a Somerville resident, if they own 51 percent of the entity, they should be included within priority applications. Boston might want to consider uh, allowing and making it easier for just any Boston resident to apply if you live in Boston, if you've lived in Boston for a period of years. Somerville decided to do that. Um, and then this is just some, some hypotheticals that I think there are probably people you don't want to exclude from this uh, policy um, for the um, for, for to get into the in, to get into the industry. And I just created these hypotheticals of people who would not, under the ordinance, be allowed in uh, under the under the definitions as it's currently written. This would be a person of color who owns 40% of the business, 
but lives in, and lives inside one of the areas of disproportionate impact and earns below the federal poverty line, which for a person of one is around $50,000, and is a resident of Boston for five years, that person wouldn't be allowed in. A person of color who, color who owns 100% of the business but lives outside of the area of disproportionate uh, area but earns over 50,000 but is a resident of Boston, they would not be allowed in. We talked about an Asian person who owns 100% of their business, they would not be allowed, and say an all-woman-owned business, an all-woman-managed business, where 40% of the women are women of color, all earning below 50,000, all residents of the city, they, they wouldn't be allowed in. So I think maybe expanding the, um, the criteria would allow at least these people in and other people as well. And I've summarized the recommendations, there are 10, and I've provided you a, uh, uh, a synopsis of the, of the presentation. Uh, and, and that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Sure. Throw it over to, to my colleagues. The criterion to be a Boston equity applicant is different than the criteria set for, forward by the Cannabis Control Commission for Economic Empowerment. What are the pros and cons of creating different guidelines uh, within, within Boston? Well, I mean, I think uh, Boston is unique to itself. And Boston has to have its own criteria. Um, I think looking at some of these other uh, criteria, including the state, uh, and looking at some of the other cities might help create uh, a, a thought process that would expand it a bit for Boston, if that's the goal, if that's the desire. It would have the advantage of including more people into the pool, um, and it would, you could still create these restrictions, but I think borrowing from what the state has and what some of the other communities have, you could broaden it. I think the concern would be is that in this industry, you might have someone who's awfully close to some of the criteria you've identified, but they don't make it. Now, I know there's other criteria in the ordinance that would allow you to consider those folks uh, with other, uh, other criteria, but um, I fear that you would fall too far below in the scoring system and you wouldn't make it at to, to one of those licenses. And I think it's important that uh, we find a way to sort of make it easier for Boston residents uh, to, to apply and to qualify. So and I appreciate the maps, uh, breaking it down for, for uh, my council colleagues in terms of uh, what are, where are those impacted areas. Uh, and then uh, I concur as the chair on, uh, so with respect to the Asian community, um, that sort of small portion of Chinatown, no, uh, a lot of Chinese kids uh, went to, to jail during the war on drugs as well as a lot of Vietnamese kids in Dorchester, so uh, they should be considered. And then on the trafficking manufacturing side, uh, there are some that uh, have reached out uh, to the chair saying that, you know, saying they, they're okay with possession, they're even willing to be okay with possession with intent, but sort of that uh, the trafficking and the manufacturing is a completely different level uh, not just in marijuana, but in cocaine and heroin and stuff like that. So any thoughts on sort of the trafficking and manufacturing portion of what qualifies an applicant on the Corey side? Yeah, I mean, I think possession and, and, um, and you know, the arrests that were, were made in the 70s, 80s, the CCC has done an amazing job, uh, and the commissioners there are breaking down. There's a great uh, PowerPoint online that you can look at. The, the, the number of uh, African-American and Latino people who were, who were disproportionately arrested contrary to the percentage of the makeup that they have in the community is, is very, very disturbing. And it's, it's shown graphically data format on their website, in, in, and I encourage everyone to look at it. There are other crimes that go beyond what most people were arrested for. Most people were arrested for, uh, it wasn't trafficking that they were arrested for. A lot of these people were arrested for just simple possession. And you know they've, they had their, their lives ruined and their criminal records created. And, and a lot of that. So I think I don't think that the intent is to get into big, big, big traffickers who are crossing state lines and possibly international borders. I think the intent is to get to uh, people who are unfairly treated during the war on drugs. But there are people who are experts well beyond me on those subjects, and I'd, I'd encourage you to look uh, there at the CCC's website. Thank you. Do you recognize Councilor Janey? Any questions at this time? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we should note, too, that uh, Shalene Title, one of the commissioners, was scheduled to be here this morning, but she is uh, under the weather, not feeling well. So thank you for that. Um, so you mentioned restrictions um, with this ordinance, and I'd like to think about this as opportunities, not restrictions. So opportunities for those who have been impacted uh, by the war on drugs. I certainly appreciate your PowerPoint and your thoughtful testimony. Um, I wanted to come back to something that you mentioned around employees versus, uh, so you were talking about how the, the state recognizes employees. You yeah, want yeah. to talk more about that? 
Yeah, um, the state guidelines um, identify employees and contractors um, that that companies can hire um, who, that uh, if they have a makeup of 50 percent or more people of color or if they're minority owned or women owned businesses, for example, if they comply with the state regulations thereof, that that would be a criteria that would otherwise be brought in to create an opportunity for someone to, to apply. Um, I know of, in Boston, um, security firms that are opening that are minority owned, run, women owned, run, um, deliberately because of the, the, uh, your work, frankly, uh, counselor, and the work of your colleagues. Um, I know of uh, other, uh, for example, I know that of a client who hired a an African-American-led uh, architect firm here in Boston uh, deliberately uh, so that they could comply with the spirit of what you're trying to do here So, and what the, st what the state has already identified as, a as criteria that would be an opportunity for people to apply. So m adding that as a criteria might be a good way to include contractors in this space to get hired and to be part of a team, um, not just the ownership itself of the entity. So I think certainly it's important that we have uh, diverse workforces and opportunities for MBEs to participate in this industry. I want to be clear that my intention, though, was to explicitly say ownership because we are talking about uh, someone who's possibly working for $15 an hour, $18 an hour versus someone who will become a millionaire as the owner of a company. And so I think it's very important that we um, certainly I want diverse workforce. I think that's important. I advocate for that in, in everything that I do, but I think it's also important that we focus in on the ownership. We know that in Colorado, um, up until February 14th, I don't know what the figures are now, but up until February 14th, it was $6 billion in sales in Colorado, $6 billion with a B. And so I want to make sure that if we're talking about inclusion and participation uh, in this industry, um, that we are very participatory in terms of who we're talking about as owners, not just as workers. So I think it's you know an and both. I don't think it's a, an either or. Obviously, I want diverse workers as well, but the ownership piece is very, I think, important, particularly when we're looking at a city like Boston with all the opportunity that we have here, and yet still we have a wealth gap of $8 for black households and uh, 247,500 for, for white households. And this is an opportunity for us, not only to get this industry right from the beginning, unlike the liquor industry, but to take real meaningful steps in, in, in closing that, that wealth gap here. Um, you talked about uh, letters of non-opposition being grandfathered in. I think that's an important uh, point. Um, the San Francisco. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if it just if you're aware. So there was a bunch of um, there was groups that come through the council that got letters of non-opposition, but not all of them are sort of up and running. So I guess to Councilor Janey's point. So do you or maybe this maybe a better question for the administration is sort of what the status is of those companies that again came through here, went through the community process, worked with the local district city council, and then the council. Uh, took a vote of non-opposition. I'd venture to say there's probably three, four, maybe five that are in this category, and I think they're just kind of languishing out there. So maybe you know what's the status of them, maybe you don't, but uh, but I wanted to just dovetail on Councilor Janey's question on on uh, on the letters of non-opposition. Yeah, it's not grandfathered. it's not a huge number at all. It's applicants. Maybe it's five or six or seven who who were uh, went through the process before this new process that's in place and. Um, so they're all in different various phases, but I think anyone that who, who received a letter of non-opposition from this body should certainly be allowed to go through the process. And uh, you know, I, I'm happy to talk kind of offline on, on on all those, but uh, that's just more of a policy recommendation that you make sure you put the appropriate grandfather language into the into the um, ordinance. But for folks' certification, particularly those watching yeah. at home, so there was a period of time when you needed um, the letter of non-opposition, and then it, and some received it, five or six of them, and then at some point something changed and kind of what changed so that made basically the letter of non-opposition obsolete yeah and then those folks either a needed to be grandfathered which i don't think they have or they needed to start this new process so I, yeah, again so maybe not the best question for you but i just yeah, I think just because you have working knowledge yeah, of it, so the it, so it was the medical sense. regime right. had required a letter of non-opposition did not require a host community agreement and now both medical and adult use requires the host community agreement 
but does not require the letter of non-opposition. So the people who got the first round of that, the letter of non-opposition, may or may not have the host community agreement. They're all in various phases while they're building out their facilities. And then, um, you know, so they're all, they need to, they need to be brought forward, I believe, uh, while they're in, they're in some form of a limbo, if you will. But I think they have legal rights to move forward. And uh, I would just think that being consistent with state law and just regular legal law, uh, they have the right that that gets included into your drafting of the ordinance. I would agree. And just a matter of basic fairness that they've been in through that process, whether it's through in investment or leases or contracts. I mean, there's, if they're being sort of held off to the side, then I think as a matter of basic fairness, we've got to address those first, and then we can talk about other things. So, but thank you, um, so, Council Janie. So, yes. Um, the other thing you mentioned that I thought was a, a very good point was expanding the definition of disproportionate impact. You had the maps. I noticed when we did our own analysis of the maps that, you know, the Boston Common was in there and, and areas in uh, Back Bay were in there and probably should not be in there. Yeah. Um, also, the buffer zone, 1800 you said for Cambridge, but the equity applicants are exempt. I, I think that's important as well. So I appreciate that. Um, but I think that's it for me. Okay. I want to make sure that we Thank you. have time. I can Thank you, Council back. Janey. Council Flynn, any initial questions of this panel? Not at this time. Thank you. Okay. Council Zakem, no. Council Siomo, any questions of Council Baker? More of, a, more of a statement on the point where, so, so I was heavily involved in a, in a, um, a medical operation coming, coming to my district. Extensive, you know, through the, through the uh, community groups, they actually won a vote, which I was shocked that they won, they, but they did win it. And we were, we, at that point, we negotiated a mitigation package for the neighborhood that would stay in the neighborhood. But when that process was like that, that came through in my district, it, it kind of came through me because they needed the, uh, they needed our kind of walk the line letter of non-opposition. But I was able to talk to the, to the proponent about, you know, what the security plan is, what, you know, making sure that you're going to hire from within the community. So I, I actually was part of that, and, and it was a long process, and the neighborhoods went through it. So I think that's something that we definitely need to need to um, make sure that, that happens. And so uh, where, where do we get, are we planning on coming up with the, um, and Mr. Chair, I don't, this is, I'm just throwing this out there, are we coming up with the tracks of, of how, how they will be, or are we going to go by the state's tracks? Do we know that? Or, or we're, so we're in the, in the language and the ordinance, it's aligned with um, what the state has defined, yeah. but I'm very open to expanding and making sure that we are being intentional about who Boston. we're including yeah. uh, in here. Yeah. And, and, and Mr. Mr. Chair, through you, um, so we look and so all the applicants, are, do all the applicants now have to fall within these guidelines? Is that what we're looking to do? It's Moving forward, Council of Janie's ordinance would be the ordinance that would govern sort of city applications, city criteria. Right, but to be clear, anyone can apply. Mm -hmm. So this sets up criteria, not just for an equity program, right. for but everyone. for for anyone. So there'd be clear criteria on how we're judging applicants, mm -hmm. whether you're an equity applicant or a non-equity applicant. Okay. Okay. Um, it just prioritizes local businesses from communities that have been disproportionately impacted, which I do believe that this that we can look at whether or not um, the state regulations are the appropriate way of defining the disproportionately impacted. Thank you. Okay. Versus well, some city definitions. Thank you. But the goal was to be aligned with what the state was saying. Thank you, Council. Thank, Thank you. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Chair. And does any uh, Councilor Wu have any comments at this time? Councilor Romelli, uh, welcome, and uh, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just actually wanted to uh, echo a, a similar situation to the previous speaker. Um, we had a, we have a situation in West Roxbury where uh, a medicinal only uh, operator went through a very very lengthy and a, I won't say contentious because they uh, they met with everyone every uh, about or every community member every civic association even outside they are caught in that limbo as uh, former Councilor Ross had mentioned and uh, I think that moving forward it is vital that we. Um, honor some of those agreements that happened before, particularly as we have a situation now where a, a would-be competitor is looking at the same 
general vicinity um, because the first group that has gone through the process has agreed to be medicinal only um, has been caught in limbo. So I, I won't ask Councilor Ross to comment on this, but I think as we discuss conversations with the administration, as, as we begin our budget process, it is vital that we allocate resources for the Office of Emerging Industries to make sure that they have the support they need to move faster on many of these things. Um, one person or two people cannot be in charge of this brand new industry. We need to make sure that the city is equipped to deal with that. Um, so look forward to that in the weeks and months ahead. Thank, thank you, you, Councilor Malley. Chair, Chair Concurs. Uh, so thank you, Michael, for your thank time you, and Chair. attention and your talent and obviously helping us sort of focus on thank these you. critical areas. So I appreciate that. Thank you for the thank opportunity. You. Good, to thank you. You. Good to see you. If I may ask the administration panel to now come down, I know that uh, John Barros, who's the Chief of Economic Development, is also joined by our Chief of Civic Engagement and Neighborhood Services. That's Jerome Smith. So welcome to both of you gentlemen. Um, I understand that uh, Alexis is, uh, is, si is sick, so uh, her absence is excused, but uh, we have two very capable uh, administration officials in front of us, both the uh, the uh, director, uh, the chief, both two chiefs. How do you like that? We got two chiefs with us today. So you have the floor, Chief Barros, uh, and it's good to see you. And uh, and it's also important to note uh, for those. I know that we have uh, several uh, alum uh, of BC High in here, so we had a big win the other night, uh, four <laughs> overtime victory uh, at the Boston Garden for our BC High Eagles hockey team. So uh, always good to see you, Chief. Good morning. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Flaherty. <laughs> Councilor Janey and other members of the council. Uh, uh, we appreciate the invitation to testify. Uh, thank you, Councilor Janey, for your leadership on this ordinance on the issue of equity and inclusion in the cannabis industry here in the city of Boston. I am joined by Chief um, Smith, and the intro statement will be short so that we can get into the conversation because there's a lot to talk about. I want to say that uh, Mayor Walsh and all of us in his administration share your strong desire to ensure that this new emerging industry be used as an economic development, wealth creation, good job securing tool to lift the people of Boston up. In particular, we want to create a regulatory system that promotes upward mobility in those areas and for those individuals who have been negatively impacted by past cannabis-related policies and laws. We are committed to working with the council and the public on how to best utilize our existing resources and potential, potentially create new programs to support an inclusive and diverse cannabis industry in Boston. Today, we are simply here to continue our conversation, um, listen, and discuss how we together can create a thoughtful and impactful policy that achieves our mutual goal of ensuring that all Bostonians can benefit from the new economic opportunities being created. Thank you. Thank you. That's good. Uh, so obviously welcome uh, to, to both chiefs. Uh, question, I guess, uh, which sort of, I guess, emanated from colleagues on the first panel with respect to those that have gone through the initial process and got the letter of non-opposition from the council. I know that um, Chief Jerome Smith has been involved in that and, um, and uh, played a critical role, obviously, on behalf of the administration, working with the uh, the district and at large councilors here, as well as all the community groups. So, my hope is that you're still involved in this process moving forward, um, sort of as the the head of uh, civic engagement. But I'm not sure what, if any, role had changed uh, when the law, not letter of non-opposition uh, was sort of no longer the criteria, and then we set up sort of a new uh, a board and and and, and, uh, and commission here in the city, but. Uh, I would be insisting on behalf of the council that, uh, that you stay sort of a big part of this whole debate and discussion because you were there at the ground level working through all these yep. issues. You know what these issues are, uh, particularly through the Office of Neighborhood Services. So uh, so uh, I hope that that's going to continue to be the case that your involvement in this issue moving forward will be uh, active and engaged, but also I guess with those five or six applicants that are kind of in limbo that may have uh, contracts and leases and investors all on the hook here uh, as a matter of mm -hmm. basic fairness to those folks uh, so that they don't lose their life savings and or their investors and or be held accountable for, for leases that they've signed or contracts that they've signed. Uh, can we let them up for air and can we bring some finality to them and then move forward with obviously with the things that we're talking about today? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I am still involved in the process, uh, the Office of Neighborhood Services. Um, I had originally had the liaisons hosting the meeting. I no longer have that. My director of policy and my chief of staff 
have broken up the meetings between the two of them because we wanted to make sure the meetings are held and they're consistent the way that they're held. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the main process, uh, knowing that this is an emergence industry, um, the mayor has taken that and put that in the cabinet of economic development. So I'm kind of helping as far as the community process part of the economic development, but it's, so that's been removed from my cabinet per se. Um, I do remember and I do appreciate sitting with you and um, she just left, but uh, Councillor Wu when she was the president, um, with the medical process was different back then when we were all scrambling and trying to figure this out. And so what the decision was um, is that we, the mayor was not, uh, we were not issuing letters of not bonds themselves and the way the law was written it was either the uh, chief executive or the legislative body of the city or town. Um, so sitting with President Wu at the time, we made a decision that the council, the district councilors would carry that, that mm -hmm. lever um, and that the, the letter of non-opposition would come from the council. It is our belief still currently um, that those individuals are cited. There is no reason at all for the administration or the city to ask for more process, to put them through another process, to do, they are done and solved. Um, so I think that any sort of conversation about grandfathering um, I think we would be supportive of that because they went through the legal process at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, what has happened subsequently is the law changed and the state went from um, not really caring, uh, actually I shouldn't say caring, not really focused on the community process to being like really detailed about what the community process is. So if you look at the medical marijuana law and the current cannabis law that we have, you will see that the medical marijuana had no real community process explicitly laid out. Um, whereas this new, the new cannabis law says, uh, when the meeting is going to happen, how do you have to post in the newspaper? So there's all these very detailed criteria from the state about what we do. And we would never make a previous applicant that you guys had already voted and vetted on. Um, I know both counselors, <laughs> they had some interesting conversations with uh, those processes. And I don't think the administration, um, as far as we're concerned, those things were passed with the previous law. They are legal. They are still going through. But any way that we can be helpful if you guys identify any issues that we do have, we'd be happy to solve those problems. Very good. And as much as I'm insisting as the chair that you stay actively involved, we want to make sure that members of the co council, particularly my yep. district colleagues, Absolutely. are involved. It seems like when the process of sort of that letter of non-opposition kind of had disappeared, uh, sort of, sort of, in sort of the, I guess, the, the engagement piece with the council. So I want to make sure that hopefully this ordinance, and we've had conversations with the, the lead author on that, that that be included at, at some point. Uh, those applicants have to sort of come back to the council yeah. or at least be working with the district council, particularly if they're going to try to locate in a neighborhood. Uh, so I, I think that in my conversations with the staff at the CCC, the, the, when they were thinking through their community process, they were also witnessing across the Commonwealth a number of cities and towns who were throwing up major roadblocks to take away the right for individuals to have access to cannabis. And so I think that what they did was that they took, they took away that letter of non-opposition because they saw that as um, political bodies throwing up roadblocks. So instead, what the city has done is we've treated it as a siting of the ZBA, so it's just like going through a normal development process. But I, again, this is a new industry. We are trying things out. I think it's great that there's an ordinance actually um, before us to have a debate about how the process goes forward. I think I'm open um, to how we do these processes. I don't think I have the, the corner of the market on how this process is done. Mm -hmm. These meetings, um, a couple councilors have been at these meetings can be rough. They are long. Um, it kind of makes you feel as though, uh, be surprised that this thing passed in the city of Boston. When you go to these meetings, the people that show up, um, you, you tell them, wait, 70% of your neighborhood voted for this and everybody in the room is in opposition. So, you know, as we go through this, I would love the support and um, if there's something that you think that one of my staff have not done well or we should work on, I I'd love that feedback. Because right now it's just two of my staff who are covering the whole city, um, trying to do their best to push this issue forward. Um, but again, feedback is always helpful. And thank you, Chief. Your work has been invaluable on this, and, and, uh, and we appreciate that. Uh, Chief Barros, uh, what are the pros and cons about doing sort of a two-to-one ratio, and could there be some unintended consequences in that? And when we're starting at the ground level, brand new industry. So, so that was his idea, yeah, just so you know where I got it from. <laughs> Let's be very clear. So, at the yeah. December 4th hearing, you said two-to-one. Right. So, so, so brand new industry, sort of one-to-one -one is sort of a, is an equitable formula, but sort of, uh, as Councillor Janey in reference, maybe you so have As, as Councillor Janey so uh, what are, what are the pros uh, and recognizes, I want to give you all the credit. <laughs> I, will, I will absolutely uh, take credit for wanting to make sure that there is, in, in fact, uh, inclusion and diversity within the industry. I do believe that looking at the licenses and understanding the distribution of licenses is the way to go. 
I think we need to balance the growth of the industry with the licenses, and so this is something that I've said to Councilor Janey. I know there were pressures for us to um, not be in the way of economic development, and I think that that's right. Mm -hmm. But I think we also have to balance that with making sure people can participate. And so I think that's the balance we've got to find. And the more we've learned uh, about how hard it is, and I know you guys are going to hear from other people later, and what the, what the barriers are, we need to talk about how to remove those barriers so people can participate. So I, I continue to be in favor of having some deliberate and intentional approach to distribution of the licenses. Councilor Janey, any questions at this time? Uh, yes, so I wanted to come back to the applicants that are kind of um, applied way back when that Councilor Ross mentioned that are kind of just stuck in limbo. How many are we talking about? I do not know. The, I, I, I think his number about five is probably about right. It wasn't, a lot of individuals didn't come forward for medical at the time. So it was like Patriot Care, there's one in Brighton that's looking to switch over. Um, I think there was one on Newberry Street. It's a, it's a very small handful. Yeah. We can get you that number. Yeah, one in Dorchester. We, we think now we have, have, I think five right. or six, right? We now have completed 11 community host agreements. Um, of the 11, four completed community host agreements around medical are cited, completed, ZBA approved. Um, I believe two of them are open for business, um, and the others are, are, are uh, you know, uh, gearing up for opening for business, but they have completed our process. Uh, we also have um, six completed host agreements. Uh, of the completed host agreements, four have gone through the ZBA process, two have been scheduled, and so we, are, we continue to move in that direction. Of the 11 uh, different host agreements, they are spread out throughout the city in nine different neighborhoods, um, and we have a good representation in terms of diversity. So when you start to look at um, participation, we're pretty proud of uh, uh, the diverse applicants, um, uh, both in terms of gender and race, impacted communities that are participating in the 11, uh, particularly the six uh, regional recreational um, retail agreements that we've signed. So um, clarifying question, I'm not sure if I misheard you. Did you say 11 host community agreements or six? 11 host community agreements. I just wanted, I just wanted to break totally. down the kinds of host agreements okay, that we so have. So out of the 11? Mm -hmm. Out of the 11, six are retail. Six are retail. Six retail. And once again, and the other five are medical. Just, yeah, four. The other four, four are, medical. are medical, one manufacturing. And if okay. you remember the uh, Roxbury site, 100 Hamden Street, mm -hmm. is oh, the right, one manufacturing right. business that, it, that has been cited, um, gone through the community process, completed its host agreement, and also uh, uh, obviously went through the ZBA. Which two are open? The two medical sites that are open are located in, one located in Alston on Harvard Ave. The other is on Milk Street in downtown. Patriot, yeah. Yep. And um, you said, how many are, you said diverse applicants? How many? Um, I believe four of the six licenses, sorry, four of the six completed host community agreements have uh, diverse applicants, um, both gender and race. Four out of the six. Four out of the six. Retail. Yes. Retail, yes. that's correct. And how are you determining that the ownership of the company is diverse? So are you saying the ownership or the person before you who has applied, like what, how are you measuring? So we are, we are looking at it both in terms of um, CEO, so leadership, of the business, we're looking at it in terms of ownership. And in ownership, we have um, a wide distribution among the four of ownership of Latino, African American, women, local owned, veteran owned. We've tracked for all of those. And when it comes to uh, uh, the four that I've talked to, all of which have racial diversity, um, I don't have the uh, breakdown on term, in terms of women uh, percentages on, on the four, 
but we've got a really diverse group of people who have come up and that we've moved through the process. Yep, and so again, are you looking at the ownership of the company? Like, are you looking at who owns what percentage of the company? How are you, how are you determining? Because my understanding from the December from the December hearing, meeting that is, the question yeah. wasn't even being asked the whether or not was not that, being asked that whether or not an applicant qualified as a social equity applicant from the state or an economic empowerment applicant. No, so we the, weren't, but I think you've corrected that now. Right. So 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 we have asked about um, social equity and um, empowerment. Uh, we were not asking in the application, but since that conversation, we did go in and find out who was who. Um, I don't have that breakdown for you today, but I will get you that breakdown. That would be great. Yep. I appreciate that. Um, and so how are you prioritizing equity in the application process? So equity, so we've been very clear as administration, we've been public and, we've, and, and in dialogue with everyone, we've said that equity is really important. We have allowed some of the people who are working um, uh, for their own business to talk to others who are working to start up their businesses in hopes of creating relationships. We've created, we've, we've, we've allowed them to contact each other or have encouraged it. And some of the relationships have come that way. Other relationships have come because people have relationships and they've talked to people and brought them in. But um, almost anyone, and I wanna say everyone who has come before us who has a recreational retail license, um, host agreement today has some level of participation. Um, I've got to get you those percentages, uh, but four we're going to represent today to you as being uh, diverse applicants that we can put in front of you, I think, meeting, um, you know, general, general understanding of uh, either empowerment and or equity license holders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, how much revenue, and I don't know if you'll have the answer to this, do you anticipate that we'll be able to generate through this industry in terms of tax? the 3% tax, do you have an estimate? We do not have estimates at this point. As you know, this is a fast growing industry, uh, but we do not have revenue. Uh, now here's, here, some of the challenge is in fact that um, um, most of the revenue will be generated through uh, sales tax. And as you know, Boston does not collect sales tax. And so we wanna put that into, um, um, the, the, so the context of talking about tax generation for the city. We do capture a 3% um, on this, but um, the overwhelming percentage, the overwhelming percentage of revenue that is gonna be captured by uh, government will go to the state. No, I know, but the, the revenue that we do capture, I think it's important to anticipate what we hope to bring in and then how we'll use that. I, my ordinance calls for reinvesting that into yes. communities that have been disproportionately impacted right. to support small business development. There's a lot of support and help that many folks uh, need to really make sure we have an inclusive economy. I'd like to switch to the community side. I've been to um, a community meeting um, that I felt uh, so as people have already mentioned, you mentioned that the meetings can go long, that people tend to be frustrated and angry. Um, and I think at a number of things. One, I think uh, some folks want to turn back the clock mm -hmm. and, and don't want to see this move forward uh, in their community. I think the other thing, though, is really the lack of information and understanding, not just about the industry and the opportunity here, but um, that it is in fact here, whether, and I believe the number from December was 51 uh, businesses that will open. Floor. And so, a floor. Uh, by, by state law, it's 20% right. of the total number right. of retail. And I believe that number was 51. When I believe we it do might the, be 52. Yeah. 52, 51, that right. there is going to be 50, over 50 mm -hmm. minimum. So I don't think people know and understand that. I think it would be helpful to do some framing. I know you've said, um, important that people understand how that particular census tract voted in that community, um, that people understand it's gonna be 51, 52 minimum, not the, the max, but the minimum. Um, and I think then the question for, for residents uh, who have questions or concerns is really who then do we wanna partner with? Who will work with us around a good community benefits package? Who can we support in terms of, you know, the local kid who grew up in this community? Um, and the meeting that I attended did not do that framing. It was just kind of 
here's who I am from ONS, and here are the people who want to, you know, bring in a, a cannabis business to your community. And so I think it just got off to a, a, a bad mm -hmm. start. So I think there's more that we can do um, in terms of educating people about, you know, the need to create an inclusive economy, the, the fact that it is here, whether we're talking about legal cannabis or illegal cannabis, and the more that um, legal stores are prohibited from opening, the more that the illegal market will continue to thrive. And so to the extent that people are really concerned about um, children getting access to marijuana, important to make sure that there are stores, legal stores available who will have the safeguards in place and the security in place to ensure that it won't get into the hands of, of children. Um, but in a legal market, anything can happen. Somebody can lace your drugs with something, you know, your, yeah. um, the cannabis with some sort of drug on top of it, which can be deadly, uh, very dangerous, um, or it can get into the hands of children. I don't think any of us want to see that. Um, so any suggestions moving forward about how we can improve the, the, the process in terms of the community, I think would be helpful, and I, I think the need for more education um, around what the city is doing, more just understanding about um, this industry and the opportunities that are available. Any so thoughts? We, we have had conversations internally um, within my department about having more uh, conversations with residents separate of applicants. Uh, I do not believe that it's fair for an applicant who is just trying to start a business to have to move the mentality of a entire community in a two hour period. Um, I believe that um, as a city, we should be providing opportunities for residents to come to forums, open houses, and have discussions. Uh, we did it in Dorchester. Um, we've done it in, no, nope, we did it in Dorchester. And we had the CCC come out um, and talk with residents. Residents had the opportunity to ask what type of questions should we be asking of applicants. It gets into your point about safety. You know, how does the product move in and out of your business, all these things. And so it was an interesting experience that we actually had the CCC and the city there, and the residents were able to say, what should I be asking, right? Because residents are already comfortable of talking about if you're a restaurant, what are your hours of operation? Where is your exhaust fence going? Where the, so they, they, in, their, in, in the mindset, they are clearly know what, what to ask, questions to ask. I think that what happens now in these community meetings is, there is a group of individuals, not all, but a group of individuals who come in who, like you said, want to fight the law and think that we need to turn back the clock. Um, and I think that when that group kind of goes off, that person in the room who actually wants to have the more thoughtful process questions gets kind of shouted down. Mm -hmm. And so I think that we have to do a better job um, of explaining to residents what it is that they should, they should get from this applicant. What are, you, what are your security? What are your hours of operation? Who are you employing? What are your delivery schedules? Where are you dropping off your deliveries? Right. Are these out front or is there a place? So there are just natural things that residents are used to asking for other businesses that they haven't applied to this business yet. And I think having more of those conversations would be great. I'd be happy to partner um, with any of the counselors, district counselors, at-large counselors, if you guys want to do forums on these types of conversations. Um, you guys have networks, we have networks, and I think between our networks we could drive a lot of residents to these open houses to have these conversations. And I think that the more that we get people comfortable with the idea that this is a legal business in the city, I think you'll see the temperature kind of lower in some of these community meetings. Thank you, I appreciate that. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts around exempting equity uh, businesses from the buffer zones as they currently exist, either or both of you. Okay. Yeah, I, think, I think that is something we want to discuss. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's something I'll challenge you guys on just because I think the buffer has led to um, sort of the diversification uh, as uh, Which is Chief, Chief um, um, Jerome, yeah. you, it's uh, Jerome it, Smith it, it, of, the, of the first round of applicants. It's, it's fairly spread out across the city, so sort of no one, yeah. no one neighborhood is kind of yeah. that feeding frenzy ground. If you yeah, I, th so. I think it's something we want to discuss, Councilor, but I, I don't think it's something that we're saying today is automatic. Yeah. Right. But I think I we think need to. There's got to be a thoughtful yeah. 
Yeah, so if the, if the threshold to Council Janey's initial question was it's 20% of the, for those at home, it's 20% of the liquor stores, correct? Because you right. had mentioned retail. Retail, this retail not, alcohol yeah, stores. This yeah. does not apply to any of the new licenses that we're talking about potentially right. creating uh, in the city. But So that's a threshold of around 51, 52-ish, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I say we have to get to that point first, and then, and then if we want to discuss talking about where, if the buffer zone is being, uh, I guess, a, an impediment, if you will, to the industry and or particularly to, to equity applicants, then I think that's when we sort of maybe start to think about where can we, but if we come right out of the gate before we hit the threshold of 51 and start to trample all over the buffer zone, I'm gonna fight the new administration tooth and nail on that. That was, so, there, was there was reasoning behind it. Uh, it was thoughtful. This body uh, supported it uh, overwhelmingly. The administration supported it. The BRA supported it. The Zoning Commission supported it. And the Zoning Board of Appeals supported it. And if we just because we have a new emergency industry, we have a new person up there, they have to be aware of it. I think we might have two competing now that are within 107 feet of each other. Uh, that got deferred a couple, uh, about a week or two ago for that specific reason. So I think we need to meet the threshold first and then in if we need to do that. But I don't think we come out and trample on it right I now. I think it's important that we meet the threshold if equity is um, center to True. all of that we're doing, True. number one. Number two, Council Ross offered very thoughtful testimony that we look at Cambridge, which does exempt the equity applicants. And so my question is, is rooted in his uh, recommendation. And so what I'm hearing from you is we need to discuss that more. I think, you, I think the public just witnessed the debate that just occurred regarding the buffer oh, zone, absolutely. and I think that and this I think uh, we'll conversation hear from that we have to testimony today, yep. as we heard right. back in um, January at the yep. working session, as well as the December hearing, that uh, equity applicants, at least, are finding it very difficult with the buffer yep. zones because the these larger companies are coming in, and then voila, there's a buffer zone, and they're getting locked out. So I've got examples yep. of people who live in my district that that has happened to. Um, I'm interested in your thoughts on buffer zones as it relates to cultivation. Should there be the same kind of buffer zone for a cultivator? So, so to, the, to the buffer zones, we also have to acknowledge that the buffer zones were created by the residents in the city of Boston. It was the reason the buffer zone was created because Patriot Care was being cited and a group of residents that live in the towers over towards the theater district had come to us and said, if we are going to do this, we, want, we do not want 15 in downtown crossing. Um, the council was appreciative of that testimony and then that's where we came up with the buffer zone. And so, any change to the buffer zone is going to have to have a public conversation because there are some residents who believe that it is a protection for them and we're gonna to have to work through that. At the same time, a buffer zone it can hinder the, ex the expansion of a new business. So I think the, you would find that we are open to having a discussion, um, but to the point of just taking a whack at the buffer zone right now, I'm not sure if we are there because I don't believe the public is there yet. Yeah. It also, so, it also, the buffer also strengthens the neighborhood association and the community residents hand in negotiating community benefits for the community, particularly if you have two or three or four competing interests for that sort of one particular area because you can't do more than one in that zone. It just allows them to uh, be able to sharpen their pencil, to be a little more creative in terms of satisfying and accomplishing some of the mutually aligned community goals and so, that's, that's also a, an added bonus to having it because it drives negotiation uh, in the favor of, of the residents and, uh, and the direct abutters. So obviously we want to have community engaged in this True. process, which yeah. is why your yeah. office is so important to this work. So thank you, Chief Smith. Um, and you know, I'm again remarking on the recommendation from uh, Councilor Ross, as well as the comments that many folks in this room, I'm sure, will be making in public testimony. Not saying we do away with buffer zones or that we create green miles. I don't think anyone, I mean, except maybe Councilor Baker, the green zone. Um, no one's talking about a green mile. We're talking about how we ensure that this is an inclusive economy where people who were harmed by the war on drugs are able to fully participate. So that's. The, the reason for my question. Um, last thing was that I believe that there was, um, I don't know, a company in Fenway that has moved through the process, is that correct? That this company is engaged in, there are allegations against the CEO from the CFO about financial improprieties, homophobia, racism, so hostile work environment, is this? Okay. So Good. what my question is, uh, one, that there was an equity applicant that was also vying for the spot, but two, even with these 
allegations um, that things seem to move quickly through the city. So I'm just wondering if you can provide some insight on what happened. And obviously, everyone's due their day in court if it comes to that for, yes. for the people involved in this. And but they are serious allegations, and so I'm just wondering what how they were able to move through the process over an so, equity applicant. So there was an article that was emailed to me. And my office does not do background checks. We don't have the authority to background checks. And so I would encourage you to work with the CCC as they continue to vet this applicant. If you should feel as though allegations have merit, um, the CCC is the one that handles those. We do not do that here about citing. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I, think I certainly want to defer to um, nope. my colleague who represents that area, that part of the Fenway. I have a very tiny piece of the <laughs> Fenway. But it, it just came to my attention. So I was just wondering if you had it, any insight about how they were able to move through. They, they went through a community process like all other businesses go through. And again, I do not do background checks. I do not have access to background checks. I have no investigators to thoroughly vet any background checks. And I would encourage uh, any counselors who are concerned about this application to communicate with the CCC your concerns. We, 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 we were made aware, aware however, of the uh, allegations and very serious allegations uh, from a citing process, as uh, Chief Smith has said. Uh, we felt they met all of the criteria and had the kind of support that they needed to move forward. Um, the CCC will take a different look at this, mm -hmm. right, as it finishes off its, its, its application process. And so we should all uh, uh, pay attention and maybe engage where we feel we need to engage in that process. Thank you. That's it for me. Thank you, Council Janey. Chair, recognize Council Zakem. Any questions of this panel this time? Council Siomo at this time. A um, uh, uh, couple of questions on the host community agreement. Um, is that a template? Like, is it a standard form? Like, is it online? Can we look at them? There is nothing standard right now about this industry. Um, we are working with you to help standardize some things. And so the community host agreement uh, is spelled out in mass state law and the regulations that are coming out of the CCC. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so we are, we are trying to follow uh, recommendations from the state. We have also added um, components to the host agreement based on conversations we've had here. Mm -hmm. And have, because of the conversations and the leadership of the council, have been able to be very explicit on certain things. We uh, expect that this conversation here, this ordinance, will continue to inform the community host agreements. So I just want to be very clear to the public that there is no, there is no template on this right now. Uh, we are developing it here, and the conversation and the work we do with you will continue to inform it. So, but we have four of, I'm sorry, how many host community agreements again? 11. We have 11 uh, so completed host agreements. They are all posted online, Counselor. They are online. Yes. That's what I. Yes, that's, that's I very think, important. They are all um, made public. I think that is important uh, yeah. for transparency's sake that, you know, everybody. And, and again, it, it should almost be standard, I would think. I mean, part of it is uh, how much <clears throat> we can tax them. Mm -hmm. So, so the, some, some basic things, uh, so the, some standardization of the community host agreements are hours of operation um, and things like natural business processes and the 3%. So the council, uh, the mayor filed with the council and the council supported and voted for the 3% automatic. So mm -hmm. that is what we will automatically get in. The whole community host agreements, all of them will add an additional 3%. So that is a standardized, we're not gonna right. do, you get 1%, right. you right. give us 3%. Everybody is doing an additional 3% on top of what the council had passed in an ordinance and hours operation. So those are kind of some of the standardized parts. Um, but then, uh, as, as the chief says, as we're going through the process, sometimes residents are asking for other things. Mm -hmm. And so you'll see some variation in the community host agreements based on right. some of those community support. What we have not been doing is uh, if a business says that I will give 10 grand to the Boys and Girls Club, we're not putting that in a community host agreement. Right. That should be a separate MOU that is negotiated between the business owner and the Boys and Girls Club, or however not, that will not be put into a community host agreement. We're keeping it purely at things the city can enforce. Okay. Um, and, and just one more thing, uh, qualifying to engage in a community host agreement, you have to get ZBA approval first, correct? Community host agreements are signed before you get a ZBA date. Okay. So then what happens if they get rejected by the ZBA? Does that just dissolve? Yes. Or? Okay. 
I'm just curious, why would you go through that step before you get ZBA approval? It seems kind of like a waste of time almost. We, 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 want, we, want the we want the applicants to be able to appear before the ZBA with everything, at, everything together, bounded together, to go before the board, the board stamps it, and then they are done and do not have to engage with the city again, and they are and off the, working on the CCC. State. Yes. Right, for li licensing and approval. Most of these things happen at the same time. It's not community Unless meeting, then sit down and negotiate. Gotcha. It's, they're all happening sequentially. The way that we view it is, is the final vote of the city is the Zoning Board of Appeals. That whole package is put together. You've negotiated everything you had to do behind the scenes. That final vote is done. Applicant takes that vote, recorded vote, and goes to the state, and they're off. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilor Baker. Chair, um, so the the three percent is is standard. Is that three percent of gross or net? I would. We I believe it's three percent of gross, but I'll check. Okay, and that and that goes that three percent goes where to the city to the to the general fund to the general fund. And so then, how does that trickle back to the neighborhood? Just general fund, whatever roads, bridges, cops. Okay, so so in, in that in that host agreement, then the the, the neighborhood has to have a separate parallel one, Jerome. I am saying that if in if a business, first off, we do not require any business in the city of Boston to give community benefits other than major development projects. And so, if we do not require a liquor store to give ten grand to the Boys and Club, and we do not require a restaurant to give ten grand to the Boys and Girl Club, we're not in the process of making them. If this business wishes to be um, a, good a good neighbor, and they themselves say that they want to do this, then they should be negotiating with the private individual or the private individuals of the community, and that's a private discussion. We'll be aware of it, but we are not going to create a city contract based on that private negotiation. Yeah. So the host agreement is looking more operations, mm -hmm. security plan, who, who, you, who your people are or whatever. Yep. Um, so we let an, an organization come in, say, say a grower or manufacturer or whoever, and they've made agreements, they've made agreements to, you know, um, to train. Like I have a manufacturing that's looking to come in and, and I've said I want you to take people from here, bring them to your training facilities and then bring them bring them back here so they're totally trained. So how do we how do we um, codify that language? So or, or who who's gonna who can watch those okay. like after you're open up or before you're open up, who's going to police this industry here if we if we don't have a budget for the emerging in industries, is that going to be in John's shop? How are we going to make sure that if we've made agreements with people around training and around contracts or whatever we make, who's going to police that? Yeah, there are certain items, and I think the parallel is a development um, uh, parallel that Chief Smith made. There are certain items that we can police, and there are other items we cannot police, right? And so um, you'll find that um, if somebody is making a grant to a, an individual organization that the city will not be policing that grant. Um, if someone is um, uh, saying that it will uh, train individuals, um, the city will want to know that it trained individuals, but we've got to be very careful to be clear to the residents of what we can police and not police, right? And right. to the city council about what we can police and not police. And so I think that on a, on a, on a one-off basis, uh, counselor and all the, council, the district counselors here and, and, and counselors in general, as we agree to different things, we should probably have a conversation of what the, the city can police and not police so that everyone's clear about the agreements and what you can expect from your city administration and what you can get back from us because it's a really, it's a really dicey area about what we have authority to police and not have authority to police. So, so with that point, I think I think we, as district city councils, need to be need to be more involved because we could potentially police that. That would so so the group that I'm dealing with that's on me to police them with with your shop. I think so. The concern that I have is when we went through the the process and they had to come in front of the city, they they had to deal with with me in in the neighborhood to make sure that there were were, were responses responsive. I'm afraid that. Like as we get away from us 
district councillors having having more input here. I, I think that we could be your police and help you because to get to equity and to get to a point where, where everybody feels okay about this business, we have to first allow some of them to open up so the panic, you know, people will see that the, the world will not collapse when this business is up and running. We have to get some of them open up, but also we have to make sure that the people that are coming in and making promises are actually held accountable on that. So, so that's something I think that maybe we should be working on how we do that, and I don't know if it happens within yeah. this here. Um, so maybe if you can speak to that a bit. So, so Councilor, first I want to agree with you, and, and I think I want to make clear something that Chief Smith already, already said, uh, but maybe make it clear that when we moved from the medical marijuana process to the recreational, manufacturing, et cetera, that state regulations change, not city regulations, yeah, yeah, right? And I, yeah. I just want to make that really no, clear. I, I, I know that, and I'm, and I'm just making my stink about it here because the state right. changed and... City posture has not changed, no. Yes. Yeah. Right, so city, city, so the mayor, and I think Jerome de detailed this, agreed with the, with the city council president at the time that the council will be formally engaged versus the mayor writing that letter, right? Yeah. And that spirit still exists. We want the council to still be engaged, engaged with what's happening in your area, and I will tell you, um, we have and will continue to direct all applicants to talk to their representatives on the city council. It is really important to us, will continue to be important. We encourage you guys to continue to be part of this conversation and let's make sure that we continue to, whether, whether before we have the ordinance, after the ordinance, it needs to be clear that the city council needs to be engaged well, in this I, I would hope so. There was one meeting that happened that I found out about literally two hours before it happened. And that we was apologize a community meeting, and, and, and I had gone through a process of, of vetting, you know, I, not that I ran the process, but I directed them where to go and who they need to speak with and who they need to make comfortable in their, in their neighborhood. And so I, I just... The city council needs to be involved in this. We're closest to it, so that would be one thing. And can we talk about the buffer zones a little bit? So if I were a city councilor and there was, there was an, an, a, a group coming in looking to do, looking to whatever they want to do, a dispensary or whatever, and, and, and it was within that buffer zone, is it correct that as a district city councilor I could, I could you know, write a, letter, write a letter or go to zoning and say, you know, with like, would it be like a, a zoning relief sort of thing? So any applicant, uh, so about the buffer zone, so the public has a better understanding what the buffer zone is, any applicant can go before the Zoning Board of Appeals and seek a variance. So, the, so as much as we have the buffer zone and we are standing by the buffer zone, yeah. an applicant can petition the ZBA and the ZBA can grant them relief. Yeah. And so there is, a, there is a way, legally, that applicants can be within the buffer zone of each other. Yeah. Because, because for me, um, growing up in Dorchester, mm -hmm. you know, in, in my neighborhood I've got seven liquor stores within you know, less than a mile. So for now, if you want a multiple, multiple operations in your district, I think that would be on you to, to support that. I personally want to have, a, I don't have a problem having a couple of them, but I don't want to have 10, 15, 20 of them and then downtown gets one. You know, we, we run the risk, you, me, and whoever, whoever else is the district city council that, 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 you know, is closest to the city. We run the risk of having this whole industry in our, in our, in our district and in 10 or 15 years saying, how did all these weed shops get here? So I think we have to be careful with the, with the zoning. Uh, and, and back on the, John, if you think about the umbrella licenses, you, you know what we, we did with that or kind of what we were trying to, trying to do with that. Same sort of thing, same sort of thing. Bring the industry into a, into a new development, you know, we talk about technology. This is going to be, this is a growing new industry. So that green zone wouldn't have 15 dispensaries or it's going to have a grow, a consumption cafe, um, you know, let the whole industry play out someplace. And then you really can, can, can drive the local business because the, the um, people that are in those auxiliary businesses, I think are going to want to be near where the business is. So when I say green zone, I don't mean dump dump Everybody all the dispensaries yeah. here. Let's think about it holistically. How do we get at the whole business here? Because yeah. it's a billion dollar business and, and what we see is just the front end of it. You know, yeah. what's, what's all behind it? How do we, you as a chief of economic, how do you think about this thoughtfully and bring all the industry here, not, not, just, not just the back end of it, the back side of it. You know, we want, or the front side, whatever way you look at it. But first, I just want to agree with you 100% that there is an entire ecosystem around the cannabis industry and we're not talking about all of it. We continue to talk 
you know, primarily about retail, yeah. right? And we need to expand that conversation because there are so many other business types that support the cannabis industry. And so, um, and, and many of those business types, I can just support with what I have in, in, in my shop now, yeah. right? And ready to do that. Yeah. But, but too few applicants mm -hmm. are, are in, in fact, I can count on my hand two applicants that, are, that have talked about businesses that are um, not specifically retail or manufacturing. There are a couple talking about manufacturing and growing. Um, and of those applicants, both said to me, but I'll get back to you after my retail shop is open, right? That, that kind of a conversation. And well, so I well, urge if we, people. If we, if we, you flip that and say, well, why don't you, why don't you, why don't you manufacture and why don't you do grow? Uh, grow could be cost prohibitive here, but, but we could also connect on to other towns that have, that have you know, Braintree yep. has, has warehouse space that they don't know what to do with. Yep. In, in, in Denver, you can't find any warehouse space anymore. It's just, it's cost prohibitive. So I think if, I think if we're directing, doing a better job at directing them and making sure that they're, that they're bringing people in, bringing people in, and with that question, what do you need to enter into the marijuana industry, whether it's a grow, a re like in, in Denver, you need to be licensed, and it's different tiers of license. So to be a bud tender, you're, your lower end, but then as you go up the manufacturing, some of that manufacturing could be eighty, a hundred thousand dollars, and it's all hands on. So, so, like, like, w w what are we doing there? Do we need? Should we be setting up training programs? Do we need? Do we need uh, licensing to, to 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 do that? Maybe that's something we should be doing, Jerome. Like having job fairs and, and mm -hmm. connecting people on to to the training. Uh, Councilor, I would say that I'm, uh, when you had, did your opening statement before we started, I was actually very excited that you brought it up because um, I'm glad very, few, you very few local officials are, are talking about this. And I think, you know, all the meetings that I've gone to so far, everybody is just focused purely on the retail license. But there are some individuals in this town who are bakers who maybe just want to open up a bakery and there's, or they want to open up the security shop or they want to get a fleet of couple cars and do yeah. delivery. Um, and we're not talking about that. And we're not talking about how we support that or encourage that. And I just think that... Um, I agree that it might be a missed opportunity, but this industry is growing, and if we're not talking about this stuff now, we'll be clean catch up later. And so I think I think I personally, from being a community, has been talking to some individuals who are like, "How do I get in this? I don't I don't have the millions of dollars to open this, but I want to have a piece of the yeah. action." I think we need to set up some way to bring residents in that have these ancillary businesses to support them and let them grow because that's also real money that they. Well, can maybe make. that's what we should talk about: some sort of information job fair, you know that. I think that uh, the council's proposal about going on a road show, I would even say that I would support, um, just because it's easier, uh, in every district having a town hall where we have you know, job fair, but also talk about the industry, what questions to ask, what you should be looking for. I'm happy to work with the councilors if that's something that you guys would want brought out to your districts. Now, I, will, I will also say, though, as we say this publicly, that all of these businesses, both retail, manufacturing, and the other business types, take hard work. Oh yeah. Right? Yeah. And so they all take, they take time. So business development in fact does. They take relationship building. There are a lot of, there's a lot that goes into this. So I don't wanna, I wanna say to the public, let's go get it. But I don't wanna, there is no turn on the switch and you've got a business tomorrow. Mm -hmm. But it is doesn't there a, happen. For, for, to get in the industry uh, on, a, on a job level for us, because if you get in the industry and, and you learn it from the inside, manufacturing, I'm thinking whether it's grow or, or the edibles and, and, and everything else that's made in lab, in a lab space, do we need to be certified to do that? Or, or do people need to be certified? And how does that happen? How do we get, our, how do we get people prepared for the whole business? So, there's, there, so when you think about any one of these businesses would have a separate and different um, uh, distinct operation plan, so that would go into a business plan. Um, and there are different licenses, right? So uh, the CCC would be looking for a different set of criteria on each one of those business types. What I've seen on the cultivation type, when you start to dig into the business, license, the business plan itself, Real estate in Boston becomes somewhat prohibitive, yeah. right? And so we're seeing a lot of folks talking outside of Boston for that. Uh, retail, because of the smallness that you know of the of the of the, of the business and what you can do here and get yeah. fed from outside, it makes it happen. So, I think I think each one of these business types take different operation plans. Mm -hmm. Take different. They have different financial models that tie to them, but also need different licenses and different criteria based on their licenses. And so you would have to get into a whole different sort of and, conversation. And, and the workers need to be certified also? 
Like, there is to be a bud tender, are we going to need to have certified bud tenders to be? There are background checks. There, there are background checks that are different, and I want to say, I don't think the regulation, there are background checks that are different, and I know in certain categories you have to have certain kinds of workers, right? So the chemists, et cetera, et cetera, right? So you have to have different kinds of workers. My guess is when we begin to develop the regulations for inspection, et cetera, these things will continue to evolve and change, and certificate programs will be continue to evolve and change, but there are some categories that already exist for certain types of licenses. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We've also been joined by my colleague, City Council Lydia Redwoods, and City Councilor at Large, Anissa Asabi-George. Chair recognizes Council Man O'Malley for a question. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good afternoon, uh, gentlemen. Um, so I, I guess I just I want to begin by saying how much I value the, the lead sponsor's advocacy in this. I think it's something we all share, everyone in this room and, and those who are watching, the need to make sure that we do this right, that we acknowledge uh, why the war on drugs was a failure, why we try to build wealth in communities that have often been left out of emerging industries, and I think we all share that. Um, I, I would push back a little bit respectfully, Chief Barrows, on your notion that the city posture has not changed as it relates to working with the council. I think there's no question you, and we've had a great collaborative relationship over this, over these issues, but the fact of the matter is, is that it has changed dramatically from a somewhat hands-off approach from the city, from the administration, from the mayor's administration as it relates to medicinal with the council running the progress and the program and sort of the um, oversight to then with recreational, the city taking control. That's that's perfectly fine. That's that's you know how things unfolded, but again, it is concerning to me that things seem to be moving so slowly. And that's not an indictment on any one of your colleagues or anyone who's been working hard on this. I don't think that we have allocated enough revenue and resources uh, to the Office of Emerging Industries. And so when, you know, Chief Smith, when you talk about doing sort of a road show, talking about job fairs, great ideas. I love all these things. I just wonder whether or not the administration has the capacity to do that well when we've seen things moving so slowly as it relates to um, would-be owners and would-be entrepreneurs sort of get through the next level. So is there plans in this budget to maybe address that, maybe grow that office, maybe make sure the resources are there? Yeah. Uh, Council, I appreciate the, the comment. Let me just, before I answer your question, say to you, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the change in posture has been dedicated by change in state regulations and laws, right? And so the the posture of the administration is still a collaborative part, part, uh, posture with the council, um, and we should continue to talk about how you, you feel that on your side. But I do want to recognize, in fact, that from medicinal to recreational, that the state regulations changed, all right? And so driven by and documented through the host agreement. No question. So, but, but so, we're, so, so the posture at least, and I'm representing the mayor and saying this, we want to work with you guys. Uh, to figure out how the siting happens and where in your districts uh, and throughout the city uh, these sites. These sites no are. question about that. And I, you know, Marty Walsh is one of the most collaborative people in government I've ever encountered in my entire life. I mean that sincerely. He's always looking to bring people together to find that common ground, particularly with this body. But I, and I appreciate your point. I don't need to belabor the point other than to say it has two completely different processes from our point of view. Right. And I just want to return to, so when you talk about sort of the, 11 host community agreements, six retail, four medicinal, one manufacturing. Of those four medicinal, is one of those included the West Roxbury location, the Beacon Compassions? Um, no. So I think they're waiting on their host community agreement. Is that correct? Um, I would have to get a status update on them. Okay. Well, I mean, again, I don't want to focus on one pro one. Uh, company or operator other than the fact that this is a this was one of the first ones that came to me there was an incredibly robust community process uh, the operators agreed to do a proviso that it would be medicinal only um, they are waiting for sort of the next steps from the administration in the meantime a would-be competitor has approached there within blocks of where they are, so clearly violating the would-be uh, buffer zone. Um, and that's unfair to me because they've done everything by the rules. It should be noted this would-be competitor is not an equity applicant. 
Um, but it just shows that there's no, because of the gray area that they're in, they could be at a severe disadvantage, and that's, that's not fair. They've gone through the entire process. They've met with countless neighborhood associations. They've agreed to be medicinal only. And I think it's just an illustrative example of why we need to obviously do this right, but, but act a little quicker in many of these things because you've got this sort of gray area. So I will, again, I've mentioned this to Alexis. We'll continue to uh, talk about this ahead. Um, when is the next, uh, it, and is it true that a company with a non-opposition letter that does not have an HCA cannot then sort of, like they can't go to the ZBA because they don't have the HCA. So they are, the, the non-opposition letters don't go before the ZBA because it was a separate process. So uh, they'll never have to go back before the ZBA. Okay. So anybody that was cited by the city council, you were the citing. That non-opposition okay. letter went to the state, which then went to DPH. You have to realize that the CCC is struggling um, with pulling the medical into them because originally medical was with the Department of Public Health. Yeah. And so they have to absorb all the medical processes. And so your letter actually went to the commissioner of the Department of Public Health um, for them to vet. So the city will not pull them back to then put them through a zoning requirement. And okay. so we, that's why I said that we are open to working with you guys yeah. about how to grandfather all the ones that the council had already signed off and approved. We're so not trying to pull that back. So there is, there is um, recognition that they went through a process, mm -hmm. but I also have to equally put on the table the recognition that the process they now have to go to for a different license has different steps, right? So we will recognize what they did. But for instance, um, we, we can't bring a medical uh, company to the neighborhood and say, hey, this, these folks are here, they wanna run a medical business, and then somewhere down the line, we give them a recreational license. We have to re-engage the community in that conversation. Agreed, which is important. We would have to re-engage a host, because they didn't, there was no host community agreement when they went through that process either. So there's a, there are some steps that they would have to redo uh, not redo. I, we we want to recognize your letter. We want to recognize the process as it was, but we do have to augment that process for a new license and make sure it, there's a there's a public notification and or discussion we needed to, uh, to before we can before they can submit back to the state. Okay, but they do need an HCA before the CCC. Yes. 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 So, so they're. I mean, limbo is that we've, we've used that word. I've used that word, but that's exactly where they are. They're stuck. There's nothing they can do until they get the HCA. I would encourage them to see this as a new license. I would encourage them, and I get they have a medical license, but this, the, the regulation changed from medical, um, and we want to recognize the work they've done. We want to recognize the engagement, but they're going to go to the CCC for a different license, and they should come to us and figure out a host community, host community agreement. And once again, the host community agreement would then need to have uh, some process back in the community. And a lot of people don't think it's fair, but they went to the community for a medical only business. But that's what they're continuing to do. They're not so, changing that. Oh, but for the medical only business, that's fine. I just, I just thought I okay. heard you say something about recreational, sorry. No, no, in fact, that's the concern, John. And I guess that's where so my you're talking frustration specifically comes about from. West Roxbury. Yeah. Yes. West Roxbury location sorry. that's, been, that's been waiting. I got and, that. And I guess this goes to the earlier point where we talk about possibly looking at um, the buffer zone and making uh, exemptions. I think that is far too premature to be even having those conversations when we're moving at a glacial pace with these things. Folks are waiting and waiting and waiting. We've got 10 or 11, 10 retail and medical, only two that are currently owned and are operating at this point. I value the work led by the chairman on this on the buffer zone because that is a way to make sure that no neighborhood has to bear the brunt of it. So I, I, I think any chance, any talk of it making exemptions now is, is incredibly premature when the city is moving so slowly on just making sure that, that we can get these things up and running. One of the reasons why we, we worked so hard on that last one. So when will the next, when will the next um, b batch of HCAs be released? So. All the, AC, all the HCAs are currently posted online. So when, as one is, as how, one how, is many, how, many organ, how many dispensaries are waiting for their HCAs? All the ones that have been approved by the ZBA are currently online. 
but you need an HCA to get to the ZBA. So you eat, so, so when you're a, asking how many applicants are in the pipeline? Correct. Yes. Okay, yes. we'll get you that. I get you that. Yeah. You know Over the number. 200. Over 200. That's a remarkably high number. Over 200, uh, over 200 might have submitted the uh, online application. I think that number is fair, uh, but over 200 have not submitted um, uh, applications at 1010 to move us through the process. Um, I think at that number, and I've got to check and confirm, you're talking about well under 100. There's like 50 maybe something. I've got to check and confirm that number, but in step two, the number dwindles dramatically. Mm -hmm. And step two is about showing that you have uh, control of the site um, and going in and filing an application with the city that then moves us to a denial process. And it's important that people understand that. The first denial process you get in step two is in fact so that you can have a ZBA hearing, right? Okay. It is not stop, don't do this. And a lot of people get confused with that because you have to, you, you appeal the denial um, and unfortunately, that's how our process goes. So step two, there is a far lower number of people who have site control and have submitted to the city. Okay. So just, just so I have this clear, and I, and I hate to be parochial, but I'm a, I'm a district counselor. As, as it relates to the, the, just the Beacon Compassions, a, a business that's looking to operate on the VFW Parkway in West Roxbury on the Denham border, that has gone has a letter of non-opposition from this body, has gone through countless community meetings, probably four or five letters of non-opposition from direct abutters and associated civic associations and neighborhood orgs, has a unanimous vote from this body, is waiting on their HCA. When will they receive it? Councilor, I am aware of the siting of this location and I will get you an answer today about where they are with the HCA. I do not, we do not have that, neither of us have that information right now, but we will get it to you. They will not then, so once they get the HCA, you're saying they will not have to go to ZBA? No, it's not my intention to bring them before the ZBA. The CCC would want to see that HCA though, because okay. the CC requires an HCA as proof that the town is okay. So okay. what they're doing now with you guys is, is that your letter of non-opposition, they're still honoring, but they want an HCA. Okay. So I will find you where the HCA is and I will notify you so you can let your, the residents in your district know. And the would-be competitor who's moved in a block or so away or within the same block, who they, I have not met with, I, uh, there was some overtures from their attorney and I said, there's, sorry, but this is, we have a buffer zone for a reason. Um, when will their, will, I assume their application would be rejected given the fact that there's already so we, because the fact that the Zoning Board of Appeals is the avenue by which they can get around the buffer zone legally, we will not tell them at the application point that they cannot apply. They will go through their process. The community will more than likely tell them that they do not want them there, and then they would, on their own, if they choose to, go to the ZBA. Um, and in the amount of opposition, the ZBA probably would vote it down. So, I mean, but how do, that seems like a waste of everybody's time. You can't, <laughs> Counselor. Council, the, the, everybody, everybody knows the buffer zone exists, but we cannot deny an individual their due process to open up a new business. And so if I want to open up a, a mar marijuana clinic next door to Beacon Compassions, I have every right to do so. And as the city of Boston, we have to put them through a process, and we will. It is up to them, knowing that they have these hurdles, to decide whether or not they want to go forward. It is not for me to tell them, no, you cannot. Start what if they wanted to uh, establish a, a retail shop directly across the street from a school that vile that but that's the, again they can go forward but there are zone buffer zones so just because we have these buffer zones we as the administration says you're violating the buffer zone we can't support you that does not stop you from doing your legal right process to seek redress that's what the zoning board of appeals for so all these buffer zones that we have you can go before the zba and get relief from it from the zba so, and again, this isn't directed towards you. I know how hard you guys are working, but it is mind-boggling that it is harder to build a shed in your backyard than it is to potentially open up a marijuana dispensary. It shouldn't be. It should be the other way around. So I look forward, I've taken up enough time, Mr. Chairman, I look forward to getting that answer as soon as possible, Chief Smith. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, you Councilor Romelli. Through the Chair, Councilor Baker on the same and, subject matter. And just quick, so um, in my process, very similar, agreed to do just medical uh, with in, in the agreement that was negotiated was negotiated which we thought was a 
was a um, community host. They got the 3%. We talked about hours of operation security. All that, all that stuff is in place there. So you're saying that they need a new one of those? Because it sounds to me like I, I was better at negotiating than the community host was. So I'd be concerned about that. Uh, 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 say it again just so we so, understand. So, so when they move forward and Who's for them. They? Just give. Um, Five Clap Street. I'm not sure what, what, what the organization is. So they, um, they made concessions. We, we, we hammered on an agreement. There was 3% of, of gross, I believe, that was, was actually at that point going to come back to the community, but I guess that's going to go to a general fund. But there were other things in place where we talked about security, we talked about, and I don't know if that's the hold up there, but I believe they went to zoning and, and approved it zoning. Okay. Uh, do you know? Do you know? I, and as, we can talk offline, Jerome. Yeah, because we supported Clap Street, so yeah. I will be happy to look into it. So as far as I'm concerned, Clap Street has all the sign-offs and a community. And you did negotiate a community host yeah. agreement, yes. so yes. I'm not aware that there's something on the city side that's stopping them from opening yes. their doors. Yeah, I'm but I'm happy is, to have uh, that conversation. So my question is: Is that host agreement that 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 I that I negotiated is that going to be good enough for the state? Council, let us go do some. Let's go uh, check. Okay, excellent. Just and, to and make sure it meets and, the CCC. And, and the reason being, yeah. then there's one that opens up in my district, and again, we get back to the, the whole world not falling down around yeah. this, this business. Right. It, it, we need to allow some to open up yeah. and let people see it, and that's that's why I negotiated this one here, why I did it the way I did it. And they, in that host agreement, said they will not come back for, for, for recreational until whatever the date was. I think it was 2020, so... Um, but thank you. Yep. And we'll right. talk offline. Thank you very much. Right. Through the Chair, Council uh, Zakem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, you know, have the similar situation in my district. And uh, Jerome, you are very familiar with on uh, Newberry Street, which I don't know how many months or even over a year plus now um, that for medicinal went through the same process. And I, you know, there was certainly a mixed response in the neighborhood, but people went to probably a half dozen meetings, some, you know, for and against, and there's just the, the limbo is a real problem. Because as I mentioned at the beginning of this hearing, it's hardly a week goes by where a new applicant does not apply, or does not come in for somewhere in District 8. And as Councilor O'Malley mentioned, he doesn't want to support other applicants who are within the half mile buffer of an existing area. This is very difficult for me to have meaningful conversations with other applicants when we don't know where this medicinal license is. So I'm willing to get into specifics. I think the point's been made by some of my colleagues. But if these could be moved along one way or the other, to get clarity on that for the neighborhoods, obviously for the business owners as well, and this is a little off topic of this, um, of this hearing, so I will stop there, but it is important for us as we continue this process. So thank you, Mr. Chair, for letting sure, me jump in. Council Lydia Redwoods, appreciate your patience, colleagues. Well, thank you very much. I am just gonna uh, state a brief statement and then I'll go into some, some questions. You know, I, I can't imagine right now, I mean, there's a lot of things going on in this industry, the pressures that we're all kind of feeling as new, as elected officials in dealing with this emerging industry, uh, what those pressures include at the meetings, the, the amount of folks who come out in opposition, in intense opposition, um, who are not or not willing to see the vote as a valid vote and really reflecting the needs of the community. We have, uh, I'm just gonna say it, some of the most greedy, um, aggressive, um, obnoxious, uh, rude, ignorant companies coming into our communities with no sense no sense, no sense, or to, to be very blunt or give a damn about the communities they're coming into, trying to locate next to methadone clinics, trying uh, to, uh, not knowing the difference between East Boston and Charlestown, I, it, it is a mess. And so I, I represent East Boston, Charlestown in the North End, and I've been underwhelmed by uh, some of the applicants who've tried to come into our communities. Um, and, and, and so that's a pressure though because you, they're, they're the ones who can get the capital together and come and stand in line and then say, oh, I was here first. And I, I remind them, no, actually, some of these immigrants and some of these folks and these local businesses and other people were here first. Um, so I just also, and I'm, I'm recognizing this, but I have come out publicly, wrote an article basically saying that at the core of all of this process is trust. The ability for people to trust that the administration, that local politicians can do this process, get it right, and represent them and assure that their communities will come out on the other end safer, um, more equitable, um, and, and more fair. That to me is process that we need to be fighting for. So, so part of that process is one, assuring local control. 
because people know who live in their neighborhoods and they also know who, whose door they're gonna knock on if the business comes in and is, is a hot mess, right? So part of local control, and I think something should be considered for this, either this ordinance or for yourselves when you're considering is, is complete and uh, is an agreement from the local business, if they are locally controlled, that they will not be selling it to a corporation after they start making a profit. Or at least something to be considered, because I have certainly asked them that. You know, you wanna talk about local control and how you're staying here and how you're part of the community. How do I know at the end of the day you're not going to flip it and sell it locally. I'm going to continue through all my comments. Um, then there's also the question of the, again, about trust and, and keeping it local is the 3%. The community that gets the burden of this business is the community that should get the, the benefits and making sure that that 3% stays in those communities. I think that would actually help with a lot of a lot of the, the, the opposition that we're facing, right, is the assumption that, uh, you know, again, I don't know that it's necessarily been proven by some of my cons uh, constituents that a marijuana business is gonna tank Maverick Square or tank um, Central Square. I don't know that that's been proven, but to be able to say they're also gonna be contributing directly in that 3% to those areas, I think would help in some of the, um, some of the, uh, the back and forth with some of them. I think also there's there's important thing, and I, I fully support when I th I'm most excited about this ordinance, is the establishment of a neutral cannabis board. I think that that is necessary to have all hands on deck with experts looking at this industry where people in the neighborhood could also petition and, and voice their concerns. It pulls it out of the hands of an individual and puts it in the hands of several folks who are sitting neutrally and analyzing how this will emerge equitably in any neighborhood, excuse me, in any neighborhood. I also think that's what really important and what's really concerning is when the process doesn't work or when we get to a, a head. And that, that violates the trust of a community. As you know, in East Boston, we have two applicants with HCAs within a half mile of each other. And that happened through this process. I, I, I support the half mile buffer for now. I actually agree with my colleague, um, uh, Michael Flaherty, that we should have the half mile buffer until we get to the 51 and then look at the industry as it emerges. But here we are going through this process and here we are now with two applicants that on Google Maps and through, uh, through several, look, several conversations have been noted that they're headed and that they are within a half mile of each other. 107 feet. Yeah, it's short by 107 feet. I'm not interested in um, the East Boston getting the variance or being the first you know, on that. I'm not interested in that happening. I was interested in a process that would work. And this, this, this to me violates and, and really really helps to destroy the trust that a community would have in process and government to get this right. This, we're not talking about things that were unknown, right? These are things that were known and could have been vetted and we should have been able to see this half mile buffer as an issue. And now what's very likely gonna happen is one of them's gonna get the variance and or is gonna apply for it and then there'll be you know, additional lawsuits and fights all the way to the end. And all of that, talk about time and money being wasted if we had simply just looked at the, the law. And, and it's concerning for me as a city councilor too that when we do implement certain things, and you're right, um, 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 Jerome, uh, Mr. Smith, Jerome, uh, that anybody can apply for a variance. But the likelihood of that person applying for that variance being the person who maybe has less capital, is a person of color, uh, is a, a small business owner versus the corporations, right? They're gonna, they're gonna apply for these variances all over the places. They have the money, they have the deep pockets, and they're gonna run roughshod in our neighborhoods. Um, I'm okay with the process being slow. I'm okay with it being slow if it's done accurately. And that didn't happen in this case. So I'm, I, I'm speaking as a district city councilor for East Boston. I'm, I'm disappointed at the very least. So um, the other thing that I'm really concerned about is also um, we're talking as though the process is not within our control. You know, if it takes us going from step one to step two to getting a denial letter as just a pro forma to get to the ZBA, that's a process that we can fix. That's a process that we can streamline and should be streamlining. This is, if it's an unnecessary step that puts people in a, in a waiting zone and pattern, then I say we remove the step and talk about how that can happen. So I, I know this is a lot, uh, but I wanted to make sure that we weren't back and forthing over one question. Uh, I wanted to make sure it was very clear. Um, it's, to me, it's, it's keep it local, keep it efficient, keep it open, and put it in the hands of a Boston Cannabis Board.
Thank you, Council uh, Chair. I can ask Councillor Anissa Asabi George. Any questions of this panel? No, thank you, um, Chair. I just I have a couple of questions. I did come in late, so I apologize if any of these are repetitive. Uh, but what, one of the, um, the questions that's come up quite a bit uh, from testimony already today or questions today is the 3% tax. And have we, do we have the dollar amount, what that what we're anticipating that to be? We're going to get that number. Uh, okay. Councillor Tini asked for it. We're going to get that number. And I, go ahead. I, I just, I want to caution because we, we can, we can give you ranges yeah. and show you what the 3% is, but it, it would all be hypothetical. No, I, and I okay. appreciate that and understand yeah. that. Uh, have we determined how much we think on the city level what our bureaucracy will cost? So we are in process of thinking not just the bureaucracy, which is a great question, and the program and services, mm -hmm. right? So um, as I, as I, as I uh, said last time, the, uh, the current program and services and bureaucracy that supports business development in Boston is all intertwined with federal funds that prohibits the use of frankly, any of the services that we now have set for small business or business development to go to the cannabis industry. So we have to either create a parallel duplication of services or think about how we do services in Boston very differently than what we currently do. And so I do not have an answer for you, but we, we are working on that and we, will look, we look forward to presenting to you the cost of the new system, if you would, to support this industry. I think it, that would be really interesting to know some of those numbers and have an idea of what yeah. um, this business is going to cost us to manage from the city's perspective and then understand what the dollar, and that's why I think not putting the money into the general fund is really important so we could sort of see those dollars in action. I think that we're going to have to look at, and I heard this, uh, this is somebody else's uh, term, not mine, but I think one that we should be looking to apply in this business, but creative non-compliance when it comes to some of the pieces that we're going to face um, as our in, in, the, in this work ahead. I'm also curious about the process at the ZBA. We saw this last week happen when uh, multiple locations in the same neighborhood are on the docket together. Both of them were deferred uh, last week, but you know, if the first one gets approved, the sec second one can't because it's within the zone or they're too close together, you know, we're gonna anticipate some sort of litigation. You know, how are we going to determine that going forward? Because that's going to continue to to occur if we don't fix this process. So I will acknowledge that that was an error last Tuesday. Um, we are currently looking at how that did occur, um, and to make a determination that going forward that that we do not pit uh, businesses against each other by being that close to the buffer zone. Um, and so legally, um, my office had asked for a deferral so that I could, so I could talk to the law department about how we should do that in the future. So that was one of the requests of why I asked for the deferral last Excellent. week. Excellent. Um, but it was an error, without a doubt. Um, and I am trying to make sure that uh, we do not put businesses and residents in that situation again. Well, and it's, a, it's also about avoiding those difficult yeah. compromising positions, but it's also about creating fairness for businesses that are in the pipeline. How are we queuing them up yeah. so, that, so that we are participating in a fair process? And th that's it for me, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Councillor Asabi George. So uh, obviously, and, and thank uh, uh, both of you uh, for your time and talents. You're welcome to stay if one of at least can stay, because we're going to go to the third panel in public testimony. Oh, my apologies. So Councillor Janey wanted to conclude this panel. My, my, my apologies. So my appreciation again. Is the microphone? Yes, go ahead. You've got it. Oh, great. There yeah. it is. Um, so I I'm interested. So there's been a lot of talk about the buffer zone. And to be clear, the ordinance doesn't <coughs> talk about the buffer zone at all. Good. That was passed by this body, I guess, or whomever before I got here. Um, I am interested, though, in understanding whether or not the city has done any kind of mapping. So with 500 feet from schools, um, even though you know, we're not asking the same of liquor stores, we're not asking the same of CVS or Walgreens that sell opioids, we're not asking those 
companies to do the same thing. We've got the half mile from another business. How does that really work in the city of Boston in terms of the half mile and the 500? Like, I'm really interested in seeing if it's possible to get 51, 52 minimum in the city with those existing zones or not. Have you guys done any, have you done any projections? So we, I'd, I'd like to see a map if you have it of just, yeah, potential yeah, yeah. So where, we, how it would work. So our chief just allowed. So when we did the buffer zone, it was prior to. It was a, yeah, yeah, we originally were taking yeah, a mile. Yeah. So, so we were at a mile. <laughs> and we, so we, we started at a mile just for everyone's edification. We started at a mile, but realized at that point we couldn't meet the threshold. Yeah. Right. We then moved it in uh, to three quarters of a mile, um, and in an effort, it was a compromise on the council. Yep. We were pretty close to. You know, a majority pushing towards uh, a super majority at three quarters. However, the consensus was we dropped into a half mile so to get the full council support, to get the BRA support, to get the zoning commission support, to get the zoning board of appeals. It was a pretty lengthy process, and half mile was. So, so are you mile. confident that 51, 52 can yes. fit we, within we, the city yeah. minimum? We, we believe through that process, when we originally proposed the mile, um, we worked with the BPDA to do site planning, and we just saw that. You know, even though we felt the personal comfortability of a mile, um, again, a personal feeling, strategically we could, the land of the city of Boston, it just could not accommodate the number that we had. Um, so the council was correct in reducing it to the half mile. Uh, then we just did, again, we just do tests. We're not, we look at business districts, you know, if you look at the zoning, it's forbidden uses in residential districts. So it dr uh, drastically <coughs> shrinks the available locations in the city. Currently, we do feel as though that we can cite the number that were required as a floor. Um, should uh, the city want to go further than the floor, we will have to have a discussion. Um, right. I think, and then I think what the time criteria is are you using to judge an applicant? Let's say there's two equity applicants going for the same area, or any applicant. How, how are we judging whether or not, beyond the host community agreement, whether or not this is a, a, a good fit? What's the criteria to determine who should get a license Community um, approval from you, Boston. We take in we take in the siting. We take in community support. Um, but I do, I do want to even before you talk yeah. about community support, uh, showing control of site is really important, and we've had some hiccups right. yeah. where very early on, we took it at face value that there was site control. Right. We've tightened that up because then we've learned that there wasn't site control, and so yeah. we. You know, we're not trying to create barriers to create barriers for people to come in, but we absolutely have to set up standards so that we can make sure that we're hitting every part of this. We can't have an owner come back at us and say, this person is doing a community meeting and there's no, I, they, they can't put it here, yeah. right? And mm -hmm. we've had that. And so we're learning and we're moving. Right. And once again, we're not trying to set up ba barriers for people to enter this space, but there are some barriers up front, which is one site control. We understand some people have licensed, um, license agreement on site or and leases that are costing, right? So it's very costly to hold on a site control while this lengthy process moves forward. We recognize that as a huge barrier to entry as well. Other folks don't. Other folks have the land, land owner, building owner, in most cases, call us and reassure, in fact, that the, they would be willing to go in and the the, the building owner is more of a process, is more engaged in the process with us and have a shortage. So it does not, I want to say, you do not have to have a lease. You do not have to be paying for your lease, but a lot of folks very early on have leases and pay for leases. And then there's the community process beyond site control uh, of the voices, city council, other politicians that come in that help us um, understand whether or not there is support for that site and that location. So site control and community process? Nothing around equity. No, well, equity is a big part of it. Um, that's the conversation we've had with, which is why we have the, the host agreements that we've had. So equity, operation, um, um, the business plan, whether we think they, they, they can execute, et cetera, all goes into our thinking. But really, we are about site and site um, uh, uh, selection. And so we do that so that we can, we can be informed in who's going in. But if people wanted to challenge, legally challenge us at the ZBA around variances in the such, it's just like a development project, right? And we would be subjective to any of those challenges that people have in, in a ZBA decision uh, or a ZBA, uh, an, an appeal to a zoning uh, uh, pro 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 prohibition in our code, right? And so I just wanted to make sure 
you know, so you raised the question around the applicant earlier where there was some news that came out that they were being sued, right? I, I think we don't have grounds, right, to pull an application based on that kind of a news. We have ground to pull an application, though, if you said you didn't want them cited there, right? right? And that's, that's, that gives us more leverage than some news about what they've okay, done. Okay, so I know where um, a lot of people want to speak, and we have another panel, so I uh, will just wrap up by saying I certainly appreciate your testimony. And again, everyone that is here, um, there are several barriers, as, as you've acknowledged here, that my ordinance does address uh, in terms of moving the process uh, forward with a what I think a more thoughtful um, process with clear criteria, um, and really help and support to remove some of the barriers that we've, we've all discussed. So I'm looking forward to working together as, as we move forward to get this, this passed and implemented. Thank you. Thank you, so thank you, Chief. 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 Thanks. Look forward thank to working with you on this, and you're welcome to stick around. So our third panel, I'm going to have our third panel come down. As they're getting set up, I'm going to try to weave in some public testimony. So if Joseph Gilmore, Matt Allen, Taba Moses, and Richard Moki Harding could make their way down across from me, I'm going to take some public testimony. Tito Jackson. Uh, looks like Sean Burt, Leah Daniels, and John Napoli. If we can kind of weave in some quick public testimony as Joe Gilmore, Matt Allen, Taba Moses, and Richard Harding, Richard Moki Harding make their way down in front of me. Former colleague Tito Jackson, you have the floor. Wherever you're most comfortable speaking, you, you can just jump right in. Welcome back. You know something, Council Jackson, could you bump over to that one just because uh, we're going to have this panel of four is going to come yep. down, and that way there you can take your time. And the public testimony is going to be from that podium uh, right there. So public testimony can line up there. The panel of four, Joseph Gilmore, Matt Allen, Taba, jo Taba Moses, and Richard Moki Harding. Um, so Taba's on one bookend, and Richard can be on the other. Former Councilor Tito Jackson, you have the floor. Just keep talking. Okie okay. doke. Um, we didn't have this new technology, technology when, right. when I was here. Um, I, I want to thank you, Mr. Chair, and I also want to thank um, Councillor Janey for her, I, I would say, probably best in the nation um, legislation that I, I've seen. Um, I think this is some of the most uh, progressive uh, legislation that I've seen um, in, the, in the country, in particular um, with the component of taking the 3% of funding um, back to actually reinvest in the community. So I guess um, my, I, I guess the mantra here has to be, does Boston want to lead or do we, we want to follow? Does Boston want to lead or do we want to follow? I believe that uh, it has been our calling as a city to step forward and lead since the city uh, has actually uh, been formed. So I think we need to step up. And I think cannabis is our chance. Um, cannabis is our time. And in fact, the word cannabis can actually be substituted for the word opportunity. And uh, what I would say is um, the question has to be asked, is this cannabis business for the few? opportunity for the few, or is this cannabis business for the many, an opportunity uh, for the, the many? Um, so let's, let's dig in. I, I think it's critical that Councillor Janey brought up um, the topic of actual ownership, because let's understand how wealth is built in this country and how wealth is passed on is, in this country is through business, real estate, and those are things that you can will to your children, and you can't will a job to any of your children. So this is absolutely about actual ownership, and in particular, and I, I do want to uh, be very clear here, the state of Massachusetts was clear in who uh, it was disproportionately affected by the war on drugs. Black and Latinos in the state of Massachusetts, in many of these neighborhoods, were disproportionately affected by the war on drugs. Uh, the ACLU put out a report from 2008 when essentially possession became legal uh, to 2014. If you were black, you had a 320 percent higher chance of being arrested for possession and a 710 percent higher chance of being arrested for distribution. And that actually answers the question whether or not people of color know how to run a, a cannabis business. Um, and so 
um, this often, and that, and that becomes an issue because I, I go to meetings where folks are, uh, you know, with large companies are saying that pe we don't know how to run a delivery business, we don't know how to do any of those things. I can get on my phone right now and type in hashtag who got the gas, and before I'm done with my testimony, I could have whatever uh, I wanted. The objective now has to be how we open the doors uh, of opportunity. Um, the legislation before us uh, really begins that process. I believe, uh, and, and I, I am uh, very happy to hear Chief Barrow step up and say, he wanted a two for one, right? We won up. We won up uh, um, our friends in, in Somerville. Mm -hmm. um, we wanted a two for one. That's appropriate because the city of Boston. I hear the word minority. That is an incorrect term. In the city of Boston, people of color are the majority in the city of Boston. So they deserve the majority of the licenses. And they've, in fact, this is also a double uh, a double hit because before four months ago, they were also pretty much the majority of people who were actually selling in this industry uh, before it became legal. Um, I don't use the word black market, I use the uh, word illicit uh, market. Um, uh, the couple other points uh, that I want, wanted to, to hit um, is when you restrict the space, so I don't, I actually, this, at this point, I don't believe that we have enough space in the city. And I voted, for, so I, I do have to go on record. We voted for medical to, for there to be a buffer. Um, I wasn't here for the recreational uh, vote. But um, it, I have looked for spaces in the city of Boston. Um, there are 126 Boston public schools. That's not including uh, charter schools or, uh, or uh, parochial schools. Um, and if we're talking about a half a mile radius in, in between, uh, it is very, very difficult uh, for that to actually uh, fly. So that becomes, this issue of buffer becomes an issue. We should be using what Cambridge is going to do. One of the preferences that Cambridge has is they actually allow an individual who's economic empowerment to locate inside the buffer. And I think that would be something that would be very helpful. Um, <laughs> To, uh, to our folks. Um, in addition, um, I believe part of that 3% um, should go back out to people uh, in this economic empowerment class as potentially loans from the city of Boston. We're already outside the federal law. Let's stay all the way outside the federal law. Let's take those revenues and, and, and put them forward um, in, in that space. Um, I would also note um, when this, this issue of, um, of, of, of holding a property, I don't know anyone who's not paying a monthly note. Amen. It, so the longer this process draws out, you're paying a, a pretty huge percentage of your rent or what your rent is going to be. So that's not including your lawyer. That's not including any of the other folk, your architect who has to draw the space out, uh, draw the space out um, and any of the engineers who, who are involved. And that's not including your your startup costs. Um, and so that is a, another critical um, component. Um, I, I do have to note, I, so I, I have two hats on. I am an owner operator. Um, as soon as the Cannabis Control Commission uh, blesses our, our company as a nonprofit, is changing into a for profit. At that point, I will own 100% of the equity in, in my company. And so um, I have also partnered uh, with a, a company to actually help. Others own 100% uh, of their company. Um, it's a program, um, it's called the Tilt Inclusion Program. Um, we will put out over $20 million into uh, the marketplace in order to fund folks. But, but even if you have that money in the city of Boston, it's still almost impossible to find a place. So even if you actually have the resources, you still are blocked uh, based on um, these, uh, these buffer zones and the inability to find property. And let's also let folks know, there is a cannabis tax. I, I, I equate it to getting married. I don't know that much about that topic, but um, when you call a hall and you ask and say, I want to have a party, uh, there's one price. If you call back and say, I fell in love this weekend, I want to change my party into a reception, there's a, a heightened price. There is a cannabis tax in the city of Boston, um, which actually pushes uh, many people, uh, in particular economic empower empowerment individuals, um, out of the marketplace. Um, and what I would note 
to my colleagues, uh, my former colleagues, if you're a district counselor with 51, there will be at least seven in your district if they were equitably uh, uh, distributed uh, throughout the city. I, I, I heard Councillor Baker bring up um, this issue of growing. I, I just have to note the tough part about growing is the capital expenditure in the front end is very, very expensive. It's 160 to, two, uh, to, to uh, $200 per square foot, which puts a f uh, 5,000 square foot grow at between 800 and a million dollars just to get uh, to get open, and that's actually not that's that's the build out. That's not even actually operating. And so again, those funds. And by the way, I, I've done a little calculation um, for the city of Boston. You uh, will have a lot of money. Um, I, I I thought about it as a million dollars per soar, and three percent of a million dollars is thirty thousand uh, dollars. At 50, uh, 51 stores, that's about 153. I'm sorry, 1.53 million uh, per month, and that's about an $18 million take um, for the city of Boston. Um, and I think those numbers are are actually low. Oh, exactly. I, I close um, with if we do nothing. What's the definition of failure? Uh, the definition of failure is Denver, Colorado. Mm -hmm. Denver, Colorado has 750 stores. One is black owned. One is black owned. If we stand idly by, we will be the East Coast Denver um, when it comes to, uh, to these uh, issues. If we do nothing, just like the city of Boston, we have half a percentage of uh, our city contracts go to people of color. If we do nothing in Boston, in Roxbury, there's 18% home ownership, uh, owner occupied home ownership. If we do nothing, we will continue to have white families who have a median net worth of $247,000 uh, versus black families with a median net worth of $8 and Latino family, uh, Puerto Rican families with a median net worth of zero dollars. If we do nothing, the most interesting data that came out of Denver is that after their legalization, there was a 50% increase in arrests of black people for sales and dis distribution of marijuana. Why? Because they don't own. They are not included in the business, and so therefore they're not being hired by the businesses that we're talking about. When women own a business, typically there are women who work at that, uh, at that establishment. When people of color uh, own or, and have an opportunity uh, to be in those businesses, they have uh, that, that opportunity. The last concept I wanted to introduce is one that um, someone that many people in this room know is a person named Daryl Settles. And at the Commonwealth Summit a couple of years ago, he said something that I want everyone in this room to think about, in particular my friends in government. And we know, you know, you know everybody, because y'all run. You, you, you know everybody. Daryl said, I have a $10,000 check. I will write it out and make it out to any person in this room who can name a black owned business that does, I'm sorry, 10, 10 black owned businesses that, do, that does $2 million in top line revenue, not profit. I don't have the $10,000, but I would say to you, I can't name 10 businesses in the city of Boston that uh, that are black owned, that have that uh, type of top line revenue. The cannabis industry gives all of us the opportunity to change that reality. I, I have a, a organization and I'm working with a program that, that has, uh, you know, double, uh, has, has $20 million to do that. Help us do that. We need this legislation. We need this moratorium. And we need you on the council uh, to uh, walk in your power uh, to open the doors of economic opportunity, not only for those who have, but for those who are disproportionately affected by the war on drugs. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you.
Leah Daniels, welcome. You have the floor. If you could just state your name and affiliation for the record. You get it. We, we'll, it's going to be on. You need it for the, for the oh. cameras to pick it up. Hi. Thank you. My name is Leah Daniels. I'm a Roxbury resident. I'm a veteran. As you can see, I am of color and a woman. Um, this was the criteria stated for the state of Massachusetts for economic empowerment. Nevertheless, I still stand before you without sight control. You can't move anything forward. That means either you're going to buy something in Boston, or you have to already own something in Boston, or your family or something or somewhere or somehow in order to, to, to gain sight control. When you do that, there's still this long period of time, as Mr. O'Malley spoke about, for the gentleman over there, for Clap Street, as you spoke about, they're still not open, they're still not running, they're still not doing anything. That's what we would be as people of color. Nevertheless, I came here to talk about transparency. Um, the reason why we sit in this situation right now in the city of Boston is because we don't operate from a transparent perspective. There's not an overlay map for zoning. There's not, not you don't know what the community host agreement looks like, who has one, when they got it, what it includes, what community host agreement, I mean, what um, meetings that they have with the community, N nothing. There is no transparency. And without transparency, there will never be any trust. Because all that means is I can walk in to Ms. Turk Cook's office because I used to be or I know someone and sit down with her and have a conversation with her directly. But me and the other person on the other hand is calling and calling and calling and never getting a, a return phone call. That is just completely unacceptable for the capital of the state of Massachusetts. It's just ridiculous. We need transparency. And we need a process that works and effective. You do not ask a barber shop person who's going to get their barber's license to have site control over a building and, and own it before they get their license, before they can even operate and cut a piece of hair. It's, it's an unacceptable way that businesses, that you're expecting cannabis businesses to operate, that you do not expect other businesses to operate under. So transparency is definitely the key, and that's the way that we build trust. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you, Thank Leah. You. John, John Napoli, or who's it? Um, I'm cutting in. We're leaving together. Jason Cook, Alchemy League as well, Roxbury resident. Um, so a couple of things I had to say is, according to what Barrow said, I had issues with two things that he said. The first thing is, when it comes to economic empowerment, business is so complicated. He wouldn't say that to a white man. The second thing is, um, when he's talking about, again, transparency and who gets chosen, it's, oh, we're going to look at the best candidate. Well, the best candidate is always the person that has the most money. So, Councilor Edwards, I completely agree with you about a process that makes sense, that we can actually get through. I want to thank you, um, Councilor Janey, Wasabi, George, and Flynn, because I know you all in the forefront of this, and that's all I have to say. John Napoli. John, welcome. Hi, thank you. My name is John Napoli. Uh, I'm a longtime Dudley Square Roxbury resident. I'm also a business owner in Dudley Square. I operate the Boston Gardener, which is a store that supplies material and su equipment to the cannabis industry. Uh, I'm also a marijuana dispensary agent. I'm, I was involved with the second dispensary to open in Massachusetts, down in Brockton, in good health, and we've had nothing but positive experiences down there. Um, I've also formed an economic uh, empowerment entity and have been uh, looking to license up here in Boston for years. We have locations locked down. We're through the application process up to the point where we've been rejected by ISD, and now we're just in that limbo phase. And here we are, like everyone has already mentioned, trying to hold on to properties, pay lawyers, pay architects, and we are going through an indefinite process where maybe at the end of the process we have a license, maybe we don't. So I don't know how an economic empowerment entity is supposed to shell out all this money up front on the hopes that maybe you'll get a uh, license. Really all the advantages are going to the big money people right now. Uh, so I think it is essential that we let economic empowerment applicants get in the buffer zones uh, here in Boston. That half mile, all that, all that half mile is doing is creating a monopoly for that entity right there and overvaluing that business. And the reason, one of the reasons Cambridge said yes, economic empowerment applicants can get within this buffer zone is because the same thing was happening in Cambridge where they'd set up a, basically create a monopoly 
for this one operator. And there's one uh, operation on Mass Ave that got bought out for, you know, 50, 60 million dollars. And that's in part because the city helped them overvalue their business by giving them a buffer zone. These buffer zones are hypocritical, they're counterproductive, and they prevent economic empowerment applicants from being able to open a business. We don't have the, these buffer zones for uh, strip clubs, for Walgreens. We don't have them for liquor stores. Why in the world do we have them for these businesses? Um, and you know, you don't have to open it up to the whole world, just open it up to the economic empowerment applicants to give them a, a slight leg up. Uh, there are people who are of this community that should be welcome into these communities without having to go jump through as, you know, the, these hoops are what prevents these businesses from opening. So I'd finally say that even in areas of disproportionate impact, I would get rid of the buffer zone for the schools. They're hypocritical. They're preventing people from getting open in their own communities. I have a spot located within 500 feet of a school in a commercial district in Dudley Square that is a strip club that we could convert into a cannabis store. And I think everybody in the community, including me, who's a homeowner, would like to see that strip club become a cannabis store that would help value in our neighborhood and it would help improve Dudley Square, which really needs improving. But we can't do that because of these buffer zone regulations. We have everything else in place. We have the economic empowerment team. We have the expertise. We have everything ready to go. But it's the regulations that this city has created that prevent us from opening and creating a, a better business environment in Dudley Square, helping uh, communities of color employ people of, of, uh, within the community and help those people gain the expertise that they will need to go off and own and operate their own businesses. Thank you very Thank much. You, John. And Sean, uh, Sean Bird, Sean, are you speaking with the minor? You guys are team. It's on the same we're, team. We're going to speak as a team. Well, if that's all right great. with thank you. Thank you. Very good. Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Thank, I, you. I, thank you for the opportunity to the chairman and Council Janey for your efforts in this. Uh, my name is Sean Birdie, uh, Rosendale resident my entire life, going back generations. My partner, uh, Armani White. Yeah. Armani, uh, thank you for having this uh, hearing, and Armani. we're a team. Uh, yeah, you want me to start? Or you want me to start? Oh, sorry. So yeah. So again, I'm from Boston, born and raised here in Roxbury. I'm an advocate who has um, pushed for a lot of what this ordinance talks about, and I love to see it happening here in the city and being led by District Seven. Um, one thing though that we feel like um, is kind of stopping us that's in this legislation that we think um, by removing it would improve it um, is a couple is like basically two or three things. Um, so again, like I'm a African American person, I qualify. I'm, we're, we're an economic empowerment team, um, but currently right now the this ordinance has language that um, has a criteria for the city uh, economic empowerment kind of uh, certification, and that is different than the state language. And so while we think the city can have its own language, it should include also the state people that are certified as a way to not exclude people um, because currently as it's written we would be blocked out of like moving forward for the next two years um, and where you know and I don't think that is the intention of the of the ordinance um, another thing is that for the definition of a marijuana applicant uh, and its relation to 51 percent of ownership I know right now the definition of applicant is a group in that um, the, the part of it is that um, and if uh, an applicant shall be designated as an equity applicant if at least 51% of the ownership um, qualifies. And so with a team, how does that work? Two people, 51%. Um, so we're just looking for more clarification because we do want to um, have as much support as we can as economic empowerment applicants to get our business up and running. Um, we are, you know, basically have everything in line. We just need, um, yeah, we just need to have this um, not stop us from moving forward. And uh, we're excited to, yeah, to see this happening and we're in full support of everything but yeah, that little part. And, and if, if I may just touch on one more of the criteria um, relating to past convictions, uh, it doesn't include, and I know there's been a lot of words um, thrown around that, that frighten people who don't understand drug crimes. Uh, for instance, I was tried in federal court in the state of Maine and my exact charge was manufacturing of marijuana plants. Manufacturing isn't in here. Um, I don't know if manufacturing, you know, this is kind of where I would suggest if the council could look into maybe adding uh, exactly what the state has, which is all nonviolent marijuana offenses as a, um, as a criteria, rather than stipulating just possession and just distribution and just trafficking. Um, aside from that, um, 
I thank you for your time and your leadership in this. Thank you. And we have uh, testimony we'd like to submit. Yes, if you have it in writing, please. I'd like Welcome. to submit. Great. Yeah. Thank you. And so thank you for your testimony. Thank you for the third panel for um, obviously your patience. So we're going to start with Joseph Gilmore, go to Matt Allen, then and I'll leave it to Tiber and Richard as to which of you want to speak first. But welcome, and if you can state your name and affiliation for the record, that'd be great. Dear yeah. council members, my name is Joe Gilmore, co-founder and community outreach director for the Massachusetts Recreational Consumer Council and a lifelong resident of the city of Boston. Um, I have an immediate family member who was arrested in the past for marijuana, and I have many friends in this room who still feel the impacts of prohibition. And I just want to thank uh, the council for letting me speak and for the public for showing up, showing support, and you know, making your voice heard. My comments today are in support of Councillor Janey's ordinance to ensure equity in Boston's cannabis industry. While mostly out-of-state cannabis, or while mostly out-of-state and politically connected cannabis conglomerates have re received host community agreements, disadvantaged business as enterprises, including women, veteran, LGBT, and minority-owned businesses, only make up 13% of those who have applied at the state level, according to the latest report uh, from the CCC on March 7th. Zero economic empowerment applicants have made entirely through the licensing process thus far. The economic empowerment applicants that I know can't even get an email response from the city. Meanwhile, 10 uh, host community agreements have been signed. Um, and just off the top of my head, I know businesses I know one business who wants to donate $1.5 million to the social equity program, but he can't get a conversation with the city. Um, so it seems like we're in a scenario similar to the fox protecting the hen house, and we can no longer stand for this. The proposed two to one ratio, digital overlay map, oversight commission, and technical assistance and training fund are necessary components to supporting equity, uh, through the, through the, though the playing field is still heavily unbalanced. So in response to the lack of participation among targeted demographics, coupled with the fact that this city is the most disproportionately harmed uh, community across the state in terms of drug arrests, the city of Boston must make deliberate efforts to both recognize and fortify equitable access to this industry. And I urge, and I urge my representative, representative, Mr. Frank Baker, and the rest of the city council to vote yes on this ordinance. In addition, I just have a few suggestions that could be considered to improve the ordinance. Uh, so number one, according to the hearing on minority business conducted by Councilors Michelle Wu and Ayanna Presley, only 0.5% of city contracts go to minority-owned businesses in the city of Boston. So what the city council should do is mandate 50% of contracts related to cannabis establishments be awarded to certified Boston equity applicants to promote opportunities through ancillary services for cannabis establishments such as plumbing, construction, security, electric, and other contractual work in relation to establishments. And one way, uh, suggestion that you could do this is by having a preferred vendors list among the equity applicants that apply. Two, general applicants are fighting over site, site locations with economic empowerment applicants when they're supposed to have priority. If ignored, the half mile buffer zone between marijuana establishments creates a pay to play scenario wherein, due to the limited number of permitted site locations, real estate is accessible to the wealthiest operators. In order to ensure full participation, this buffer zone should not apply to certified ec Boston equity applicants. Uh, regarding uh, number three, regarding a local Boston expungement program to automatically expunge cannabis convictions, which I haven't heard much discuss, discussion about, which I feel is very important. So cities including San Francisco, California, Newark, New Jersey, Portland, Oregon are calling for the automatic expungement of marijuana crimes through the use of new technology. The program created by Code for America would allow district attorneys to use new technology to determine eligibility for record clearance under the state law, automatically fill out the required forms, and generate a complete motion in PDF format. And the district attorney's office can then file the completed motion with the court. So I believe the city of Boston should look into this technology and implement that. Um, number four, considering adding cooperatively owned businesses should be an added point uh, to qualify for Boston's social equity program. In Somerville, which isn't even a disproportionately harmed community, they recognize the importance of cooperatively owned businesses to incentivize communal and generational wealth. As an alternative option for local residents to acquire funding and access to ownership, Incentives for community-owned marijuana establishments should be a priority in Boston. And the last one, number five, I believe that there should be shelf space for equity applicants in the retail dispensaries. 
Retail dispensaries operating in the city of Boston should require 51% or more products sourced from equity certified applicants. This would help incentivize more accelerator and incubator programs to mentor equity applicants and reduce barriers to entry while getting local products in dispensaries. And I'd like to close with, um, I'd just like to implore the city council to consider these suggestions to bolster opportunities for those who have been historically disenfranchised. These individuals must, or these initiatives must not be subverted as an afterthought. And as constituents of the city of Boston, we demand equity and transparency be foundational components to the rollout and process of this industry. Thank you. Thank you very much. M Matt. Hi. My name is uh, Matt Allen, and I'm field director of the ACLU of Massachusetts. I'm also the former chair of the Public Safety and Community Mitigation subcommittee of the uh, Cannabis Advisory Board. That's an advisory board that was founded by the uh, Adult Use Law to advise the Cannabis Control Commission. And I'm the former president and founder of the group that brought the medical marijuana ballot initiatives to the voters and the author of the uh, uh, report that uh, Tito Jackson mentioned on the racial disparity in marijuana enforcement here in Massachusetts. And in those roles, I've certainly gone to a lot of these community meetings that uh, we've spoken about where residents uh, were talking to dis potential dispensary operators about the impact of the business on the community. And I'm hopeful that now that we've made a lot of progress and, and these dispensaries is op have opened, one that's just right down the street on Milk Street, that a lot of these fears and myths about unintended consequences are beginning to, to dissipate. And in fact, there's a lot of data at this point uh, that, that indicates that dispensaries have a positive effect on communities. There are studies from the LA uh, Police Department from 2010, UCLA 2012, uh, 2014 study by the University of Colorado, a 2016 meta study. Uh, the one in Colorado found that residents do not perceive a dispensary as an undesirable use of a storefront. And in fact, these dispensaries uh, have a positive impact on the neighborhood in terms of reducing crime. So. Um, we've also seen uh, in Colorado and in Massachusetts, as Councillor Janey pointed out, dispensaries don't increase access to marijuana, especially by youth, but, but decrease it by undermining the illicit market. And there's data in Colorado that has shown that youth rates of marijuana use have, have steadily declined since medical marijuana was legalized there. So I'm heartened to hear the, the, the city mention that they could play a role in uh, helping educate communities as these discussions take place because, uh, you know, I, I understand the, the, the vehemency that we've seen, the, the vehement reactions we've seen in some of these community meetings and the need for the council to address these concerns from coming from community members, but I completely agree uh, that a lot of those concerns are not, have not come to pass and it might be time therefore to, to revisit this buffer zone, which as we've heard is, is really uh, creating a barrier to equity entrepreneurs. When it comes to the history of the drug war, you know, we've heard a little bit about the statistics that indicate that communities of color have been disproportionately prosecuted for uh, activities that are now legal. I think that has to do with implicit bias, but also explicit bias, and the very nature of uh, policing, which tends to drive uh, enforcement in, in certain communities, tend to be poor communities and communities of color. And the ACLU has another report uh, on the stop and frisk uh, program uh, of the Boston City Police that found that black people are 64% of those who are stopped at frisk by police, but uh, they make up you know, only 24% of, uh, of the population. And I think that's a clear indicator that we've not only have had, but continue to have uh, disparities enforcement to indicate the need for this kind of program. So I want to thank Councillor Janey for bringing this forward. Uh, and I think we do have a chance to lead the nation here in Massachusetts. The law itself was silent on municipalities putting in place this kind of equity program, but the Cannabis Control Commission has offered an uh, advise, uh, advisory uh, position paper uh, that encourages municipalities to put in these kind of programs. One of the things that they emphasize is that it makes sense to have this ratio of approving equity applicants and non-equity applicants. And I would echo what we heard before, that while the state recommends a one-to-one -one ratio, why not go to two or three or four if the uh, um, you know, there's enough entrepreneurs there to, to fill that need. It's also crucial that these companies have technical assistance. You know, it takes a lot of resources to navigate uh, the Zoning Board of Appeals, uh, these community processes to get consultants, uh, you know, who can put together these applications. The big, well money conglomerates that come in from out of state hire consultants to all, uh, you know, do all this, and a lot of these entrepreneurs are, are, are doing it on their own. Uh, filling out the application itself can be difficult. You've got to be very clear on different security protocols and technical aspects of growing. Uh, 
that even if someone has the expertise, expressing that in an application can be very difficult. But I also want to emphasize that, uh, you know, when we look at uh, what former Councilor Jackson said about what is failure, we've seen that not just in Colorado, but in Maryland, where they put together, they put in place a program that was meant to advantage equity applicants, but there was no funding. Uh, to, to back up that promise, and therefore we they ended up with the same kind of thing in, in Denver. So we not only need technical assistance, but, but really business loans that are available to these, these uh, entrepreneurs. So I think that the tax revenue of 3% uh, would be a, a, a good source of funds to promote these loans that would help people navigate the process. Just one final point I want to make is that uh, you know, uh, commenting on what, what Mr. Berte said, uh, I think it makes sense to ensure that any requirements here at the uh, state level, uh, city level are not more restrictive than the economic empowerment or the equity uh, program at the, the state level. Um, that includes ensuring that all marijuana crimes uh, are, you know, part of what could certify someone to be part of this program. <laughs> But there are also parts of the state equity program that talk about any uh, drug conviction. And we heard earlier that there was some perception that some drug convictions are uh, you know, not appropriate, such as you know, trafficking or manufacturing are not appropriate to certify someone for this program. And I just want to encourage the council to look closely at the definitions of those crimes. You know, the drug war is, in fact, not over. We've legalized marijuana, but we have not drawn back a lot of the draconian policies that are in place when it comes to other drugs. Trafficking, for instance, it sounds pretty bad, but I think we've got to keep in mind that the definition of trafficking that's on the books was put in place by the proponents of the drug war to justify going after small dealers and even people who are just using drugs for personal use because they have a substance abuse uh, disorder or because they're just using recreationally and don't have a disorder and cast them as sort of big drug kingpins to justify you know, putting more money into law enforcement and more convictions. But if you look at, for instance, what the limit for trafficking is of a class B drug, which includes cocaine, it's 18 grams. That's just a, basically a little more than a couple packets of sugar. So, um, 18 grams is a little more than a packet of I'll have to go back and... and, and it's a half. It's a half. It's a half. Yeah. Right, I'll, I'll have to... Right. Retract that statement. Well, I, I'm going to check my math on that. You don't need to check your math. Okay, let's continue with the hearing. We've got a lot of people who want to testify. Please continue with your presentation, Matt. Well, we're not talking about... Uh, you know, airplanes, we're not talking about kingpins who are bringing in uh, drugs from overseas or a 747 full of pounds of... Uh, a lot My point is that we're not talking about people who are... Who are Trafficking does not necessarily mean that we're talking about people who are crossing state lines, who are fueling, uh, you know, working with drug cartels, filling 747s, or, or, or really fueling this epidemic. Um, and I take your point about uh, my math and 18 grams uh, being wrong. I will have to, what I want to check is not the math, but the statute, because I have looked at this before. And I think there are some uh, uh, levels of, of, of trafficking that really do constitute personal use. And I would look forward to, to, to responding directly to you, Councillor Baker, uh, to clarify that. Thank, Thank you. you. Any final points? No. Good. Okay, Richard and Taba, would you guys introduce yourselves and make your presentation? You go first. Um, hi, how you doing, Councilor Jenny? Thanks for having us. Um, my name is Taba Moses. I'm the CEO, owner of Green Soul Organics. Um, we are an empowerment applicant group. Um, we positioned ourselves to hopefully be the first seed to sell black-owned company on the East Coast. We have a cultivation agreement, um, a host agreement with Fishburg for cultivation. Um, we have a site in the South End, 549 Columbus Avenue. And we've just secured a site on the outskirts of Fenway um, as of last week. Um, I think here, there's a chance to really change the story here. Um, if you really look at what's been going on, um, the opportunity for generational wealth for people of color. The big question here for me is what the cannabis industry means for the community and for people of color that have been affected by the war on drugs. Um, I think Councilor Cheney's proposal is extremely important for our community and it speaks to the need to create a platform which will ensure that we end up with real skin in the game.
The issue of economic access for people of color is just as important today as the right to access public accommodations were for people of color back in the 60s. When you look at the process from the standpoint of equity, there are some real stumbling blocks here. And um, what I did was put together a list of barriers that we went through um, going through this process. And I'd like to share that with you guys. Um, barriers for pre-application, right? So pre-application barriers to entry. Understanding how to navigate CCC web portal and getting the right answers to questions you might have about your license and what you're interested in applying for. One. Two, economic discrimination. Three, forming your company on paper. Four, understanding corporate structure. Five, Hearing the right, hiring the right legal team, general counsel, cannabis attorney, zoning attorney, corporate attorney, real estate attorney. These are all people that you need in order to move forward with this process or finding someone that can do it all, which is likely impossible. Six, competing with commercial realtors, competing with big business for space, overcoming the half mile distance rule between yourself and an existing location finding landlords that will do business with you, finding a lawyer that can represent you without being in conflict of interest, executing an LOI and negotiating lease terms. That's before you even get to the point where you're going through the license process. So we went over all those hurdles and then we got to our second barrier of entry, which was identifying a location, right? It's one of the hardest things to do. So I spent about a year calling people, and when I realized that all the commercial realtors who were representing big business didn't have my best interests, I began calling landlords. I began doing my research, finding out, well, who actually owns the property and having conversations with them. Um, those barriers here, creating a detailed business plan. I don't think people under, understand how hard it is to put that together. Developing a marketing plan so you can present yourself. Finding and hiring architects familiar with the process. Creating and filling the slots on your org chart with real people that can get the job done. Understanding what it takes to put your company in a position to receive help, whether it be from the city, an investor, or what have you. Creating a company structure that works for your business, your partners, and the people you intend to hire. Understanding the difference between debt, convertible debt, and equity investment so that you can raise money the right way without undervaluing or losing control of your company. Finding a good accountant. Understanding how to navigate the community, city, and state process. Packaging and presenting your company in a way that shows you have full understanding of all the ins and outs of the business and that you're capable of meeting all the requirements which the city and state demand. We're at the process now where we did our, um, we filed our application and we're waiting for our rejection letter. And then moving forward, I thought about all the barriers to success that people have to look at in order to be a successful business once you get the license to open. Um, so what I have here, securing the right amount of financing so that you can operate at full capacity. Getting past the learning curve. Opening up a bank account for your company. There's only one or two banks that allow you to open up, right? So even if we have a license, where do we go? What's the process for being introduced to the president of the bank or whoever is going to allow you to open up a bank account and what's that conversation look like? Um, implementing workforce development and staff training programs. Just because we have a license, it doesn't mean that we know how to operate the business and conform with whatever the state regulations are. So one of the biggest things is making sure that people who have empowerment applications that are filed aren't being set up for failure. Um, forming key partnerships with brands, people, and companies in the cannabis industry. Networking and forming relationships with ancillary businesses and companies that provide services you might need to run your business at the local level. Sourcing product. Wholesale agreements that ensure your shelves stay stocked and that your retail locations will have a chance to be profitable. I think that's a huge concern. Um, I think there's, there has to be choice. We have to create opportunity structures that allow people who end up with retail to negotiate good deals so that they're not stuck, right? Just because you have a license, you have a retail, you still got to figure out where you're getting your product from, how much you're going to pay for that, and what does that actually mean for your business? Um, Understanding and um, understanding and implementing best practices. 
And then finally, identifying how to operate a POS system, which fully integrates with metrics, state mandated adult tracking system, and complements your efficient, efficiency retail model and customer flow. Then understanding the intricacies of running your business so that you are always prepared for city and state regulatory inspections and audits in order to avoid potential citations of being shut down. So these are the things that I've come up with and what I've actually been living through with my group, right? And I think those are the things that really have to be addressed, and we got to find out how we create opportunity structures between the city, the state, landlords, and people in our community so we can really make this work. Thank you. Thank you, Tabo. Anything to add to that, Richard? Is this on? Yes, it is. You got it. Yep. Uh, so, and I think Tabo spoke about a lot of the things. I think there are other people here, uh, Mr. Jackson, and other people who hit some very key points. I think, though, and I want to thank you, uh, um, Councilor Draney, for your ordinance. Um, I would just say this, that you asked the most profound question in the room today, who will benefit? And I think the precedent has been set. I think that the people who will benefit will be rich guys from Nevada, California, New York, and Colorado. Um, the precedent is set. <clears throat> we know who will benefit if we don't do this right. And I think that, quite frankly, they're waiting for the big guys are waiting for you all here at the city council to blink. They're waiting for you to just acquiesce to what happened all across the country and allow the conglomerates to rule the day. And so what we've been trying to do with our group is just to do it the right way. We've taken our time. We've been um, methodical about putting our group together. Um, our diversity is real. If you look at us, we are who we say we are. Um, you can look at our, um, all the folks involved with us. We're not the token anything. We're the owners of this company, and we're going to move this forward um, as best you help us and let us in, in the right direction in the name of uh, social justice and community. What we've done is, in our opinion, we've created a model that could be the model for the state and having a nonprofit, the Green Soul Foundation, which is going to set up a workforce training program so they actually have skilled workers who can come into the business that we own, as well as uh, training skilled workers for the rest of the up to 52 here in Boston and across the state. We think that, like any other emerging industry that's new, you have to have skilled workers that are ready to hit the ground running. We, we've learned from our friends in Cambridge in the most innovative square, wor square mile in the world in Kendall Square that residents are shut out from the Googles and the Microsofts and all of the bio and life sciences. This is a fact. So we don't need to think about what might happen if we fail. We know what's going to happen. And so our organization um, has really been um, guided by making sure that we're holding the social justice values that you espouse um, to heart, by making sure that we understand that giving back to community um, is really about making sure the community has a place at the table. The war on drugs has been destructive to many, and we think that um, our, our model with Green Soul and the job training of a highly skilled workforce will be helpful to train anybody who wants to be a bud tender, a, a cultivator, all the way up to the executive um, place in this industry. Lastly, I'd say, um, I think that Boston is, it, it can be a leader, quite frankly. I think this hearing today has shown that Boston has the capability to lead. I know that, you know, our friends in Somerville, you know, they put it together for what works for them, but I really think that this industry in Boston will be tailored by you. You have to make sure that it works for the residents that you support, and we hope to be a part of that emerging industry, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Richard. Thank you. If I could just uh, respond to uh, Councillor oh. Baker's objection, I just want to know a packet. I just took a packet of sugar is two to five grams, so 18 grams is you know four to five packets of sugar. I I yeah I think I understand. It's not light, sir. Uh, the point I want to make is that the state level regulation for equity says anyone convicted of any drug crime, and I just want to say, you know, if someone has that drug crime, we needn't, uh, I, I don't want to. The issue was you making light of the fact of, of 18 grams of cocaine. Cocaine tore through our neighborhoods, destroyed thousands of families in Boston, and you shouldn't make light of it. I certainly don't that mean, my, yeah, I understand, we're sir. We're talking about marijuana here. Marijuana is a little bit of an animal, you know. You yeah. Can, whatever. Thank you. If you want to have a meeting, Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Any questions of this panel? Councillor uh, Kim Janey? Uh, just a couple. Thank you all for your very thoughtful testimony. Um, I wonder, Matt, if you could speak to you. There's a report I think that you guys did at the ACLU that uh, talked about 
that dispensaries do not attract crime, 2012. Yeah. yeah, I was in that case. I was citing a report that I believe was done by the by UCLA, um, oh, yes, where they I'm looked sorry. at yes. at, 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 UCLA, at dispensaries. UCLA, not ACLU. Yeah. So, so there is a lot of data on that. I, you know, I will send in my testimony that includes references to four reports. I've also um, talked to city councilors and uh, worked with a group called Americans for Safe Access that worked to implement medical dispensaries across the country. It actually has some testimonials that, that city councilors in California provided to that group where they go on record saying, you know, I, I, I was very hesitant to bring this dispensary to my community in the, uh, at the beginning, but after seeing how it was implemented and seeing the partnerships that they made with local business, you know, I think that, that uh, uh, it's had a net positive Thank on you. the neighborhood. And you mentioned, I think, in your presentation about the impact on public safety as it regards to, to young people, to youth, and that in Colorado there's been a decrease. Absolutely. I, was in I'll, I'll, I will uh, certainly send uh, that information that to helpful. the committee as well. But that's, that's data from the Department of, of uh, Health uh, for the state of Colorado itself. And then finally uh, for you, uh, which groups have been most impacted by the prohibition on cannabis in Massachusetts? I think there's no doubt that, uh, you know, when we looked at the FBI data uh, that uh, Councillor Jackson cited that found that uh, black people are more than three times uh, more likely than whites to be uh, prosecuted, be arrested for um, possession and seven times for distribution, that data only categorized people in terms of black or white because of how the records that the FBI uh, keeps are categorized. So I think that if we were to include uh, Latinx people and other demographics, you probably would see the, those numbers actually go up higher. Yep. And um, final question for this panel, because I know we've got a lot of folks who, who want to speak. I'm interested in the operators, what your experience has been with the city. You cited um, all of the things that you have to kind of get in order to, to move through a process, to open up really any business, because starting a business is not an easy thing. But if you could speak to how the city's process could be improved uh, in terms of your own personal experience moving through the, the system. So, so why don't I start with just some of the barriers and let Tava take up. So I think that not much of what people said is true. It's very, very hard. The site pieces can you the, the siting is extremely difficult um, to be able to secure sites and secure a either landlord or someone who is invested in the project without being taken over the barrel, quite frankly. There are people in this business now who are just going around just buying up sites and, and locking down sites. And so that's one big barrier. I think that it's also um, very, very um, hard to really understand all that's going on, meaning that the process has to be a little bit clean. I think that people like John Barrows has been great to our particular group in, 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 in showing us the way to do it the right way, but I think that much of what you heard today is consistent with what we're going through as, a, as we're trying to pull our license together and get um, approved. Yeah, Mtaba, if you just want to add, I'm really interested in how the city, some, a lot of what you mentioned the city can't control, like people gobbling up all the land, but if you can talk about how the city uh, could do a better job at helping operators like yourselves move through the system. That would be helpful to me. No, definitely. So um, from my point of view and my perspective, I think if the city can help landlords create some sort of opportunity structure, which will incentivize them to rent to empowerment applicants, that's the beginning of what needs to happen to allow people to actually find a place, and then begin to move forward with the process. I think after someone finds a place, there has to be some sort of technical assistance program that helps people say, look, even though you just applied with the CCC, right, there's all these things that you need help with. So when people get locked up on the street, right, you get a public defender, um, however much they get cost, you get a list of lawyers and they say, we're gonna help you, right? If the city has a list of lawyers that say, look, we're dedicated to serving these big businesses, but we're also gonna put time in, right? We're gonna allot time and maybe the city will reimburse us for our time to actually help people walk through the process. I think that's the biggest hurdle. So you say everybody applies and then all of a sudden there's a huge drop off, right? So that drop off is understanding what the next phase of the process Processes and being able to organize a team that can actually help you push forward. No one's going to open up a business on their own, 
right? And if you can't create a team that's going to help you get to those next steps, then it's never going to happen. No matter how much you think you know what's around in your neighborhood and you can speak to the community and you can say, you know what, we know what we're doing. Without that, if you don't have the legal expertise, if you don't have the support of the community, a community liaison that can help you navigate the community and say, these are the people that you need to talk to in order to start thinking about how you're going to engage with the community so you can move forward. I think people are lost when it comes to that. And then with the whole economic empowerment, I think people are talking about they don't want the half mile zone. Nobody wants competition, right? I think there's enough money in this business for everybody. And then when you look at places where there's high traffic, right? So if you can identify the north end, you can identify Fenway, you can identify some places in South End, you can say that there's enough money in those communities and enough foot traffic to support more than one business. So if you say there's going to be one big business that comes in and gets it, right? Why not say we're going to save a slot, right? for an empowerment applicant in that area, he'll still have to find a location. But if you incentivize landlords and say, you know what, we're going to have an empowerment applicant that's going to have a slot. We don't know who he is, right, who he or she is, but we're going to have a slot for them and help them move through that process. I think you can begin to even out the playing field. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think that also if you continue to remind people that this is going to happen. I think we've been in so many conversations where people just think this isn't going to happen, the clock's going to be turned back. I think if the city can remind people that not only was this voted, but it's, it has arrived, I think it could change the game. Sometimes you go to these meetings and people will say to us, they've said to us, why don't you go to Prudential? You should go to Mattapan. The reality is we're coming to you where it's at because we think this is a prime location. And if people, the attitude can change, start beginning with the city to inform people that this is going to happen, I think the transition might be better for all of us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to uh, panel three. Thank I you. really appreciate your time and attention. We're Thank now you. going to go to, uh, we've also been joined by our colleague, City Council President Andrea Campbell. We're going to go to public testimony. We're an hour and 15 minutes over the slot. We have a hard stop at 1.30 because we have another hearing coming in. So we have like 15 people that have to testify testify in the next 15 minutes, so if I can ask folks to be as succinct as possible, um, 30 seconds to a minute would be would be respected by the chair, but we do have a hard stop at 1.30, so to be inclusive of as much testimony as we can, so I'm just going to have folks step right up to the mic and just identify yourself and any affiliation, I'm going to check you off. Thank you, ma'am, for your patience. You're welcome. Thank you for your time. My name is Goli, and I'm from Village Piff Co-op, and I'm here to encourage more cooperatives in the city of Boston and to really for Boston to think about land use and allowing and putting aside land for economic empowerment applicants, black farmers. A lot of the black farmers within the city do not own land, so we're kind of counting on the city to step up and make a space for us. And then adding to that point is, we live in one of the best educational cities in the world. Why aren't we leaning more upon Harvard, UMass, Northeastern, you name it, to get involved and give back to our community? They came into our community, they've taken our housing, give back something to us, whether it's interns, whatever. They could help us out in big ways, and I think that as city officials go forward, they should really think about engaging with these schools and the land use. Great. Thank you very Thanks. much. I'm Amonique, and I'm Amonique, and I'm representing Village Piff Cooperative. Um, same thing. I'm here to hope in hopes that you guys will prioritize cooperatives and small businesses. But by by prioritizing cooperatives, it gives an opportunity for multiple people to come under one license and be owners of a business and start up their own business. Um, it, it's a real economic growth for the mass of people um, in the community. So I'm really just pushing for prioritization of cooperatives. And like my mom said about building a relationships with the um, colleges, we're out here as advocates doing this on our own and partnering with certain people, but if you guys build that relationship with BU or Northeastern, whatever, and set up a thing where it's our internship, and maybe then later turns on to a full job and they're, they're part, and if it's a co-op, then they could be, become an owner of that, too. Awesome. That's it. Thank you so much. Appreciate you. So, and we have two mics, so just start to queue up, folks. So I'm just going to continue to take public testimony. Please be as brief and succinct as possible. We have 13 minutes left to fill everybody, and you have the floor, sir. Name and affiliation. Uh, Thank you for the time. My name is Harry Jean-Jacques. Uh, I, I grew up 
and I'm a resident of Boston. I have a record. Um, in fact, Councilor Flynn used to be my probation officer. Uh, I want to talk to you briefly about why people like me are locked out of the billion dollar green rush. After getting involved with the process, because my brother is an economic applicant, he was rejected, I decided to uh, pursue the ancillary market industry through making my own media company, Dark Matters Media. Um, as a former local union carpenter for the city of Boston, I've never personally seen many contractors awarded to black and brown people. I think we could fix a huge problem in equity, everything you're talking about right now, by getting black and brown people who've been affected by the drug war, who have felonies, automatically get those contracts through the uh, ancillary uh, infrastructure. Another thing would be education. I hear a lot of people being misinformed. Uh, I'm taking it upon myself with the people I know, MRCC, uh, Chauncey Spencer behind me, uh, economic applicant, to educate people at the Z Gallery at 351 uh, Dudley Street in Roxbury. Hopefully you can all join me there weekly. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Enid Pope, and I live in Boston. I'm a resident of Bay Village, and I'm speaking up um, as the economic empowerment applicant. Um, I was one of the 120 people who were approved, and um, I went through the strenuous process of trying to submit an application and respond to the questions that the commission had for me. I wanted to just uh, reiterate some of the points that were mentioned by the gentleman from Prince Lobel, and that is um, the whole economic uh, priority applicants. They're somewhat, uh, you know, missing from the ordinance. Uh, there is a mention of them in um, the criteria section where it does state uh, to identify yourself as an economic empowerment applicant. Um, however, there is no other mention um, elsewhere in the ordinance. And so I do feel like economic empowerment applicants should be added as well as uh, to the same uh, category of equity program applicants. And so that's weighted at 20%. So I think that should be added. Um, I also uh, feel like, um, yeah, I feel like it should be weighted at 20%. And I also feel like the application requirements uh, where it states whether or not the applicant is a designation that should be recognized as well. Uh, economic empowerment applicants are the only applicants that are required to hire quarries and also 70, have 75 percent of the pop, of the employee and staff from disproportionately impacted areas. And based on the way the program is written, those who go through the Boston equity program will be general applicants, and they will not have the same requirements. So I'm just encouraging you guys to factor in these economic empowerment applicants, um, also incorporate them more into your language, and also have them weighted um, at the same 20% uh, as Boston equity applicants. Very good, thank you very much. We're next, we have 45 seconds each, go ahead. Okay, um, my name is Desiree, I'm from Roxbury, and I'm just going to cut it short by half. Um, I want to just um, let people know that most of um, the people that have agreements negotiated by the city to this day, um, some of the members of the ZBA sitting on the boards of these same companies perpetuate the notion that only city insiders have the chance to successfully open in the city of Boston. Um, surely we know they can abstain from voting on their own interests, but is, it, is this really enough? How can the normal person compete with that? To address the concerns, I propose that the City Council take control of any licensing decision from the Mayor's office and into the control of the City Council. A body of 12 elected officials is more properly suited to determine what's best for the communities they serve. For Thank these you. reasons, I support Kim Janey's proposal, particularly the moratorium for big business from out of state who stand to exploit to the, the most fruitful years of this emerging industry, years one through five. I also propose the current HCAs are re-examined until further participation by people who are mandated by the state law to have full participation is matched at a ratio of one to one. This would reaffirm the city's commitment to creating a system of inclusion the law was intended to promote. I also support 
um, Boston creating its own economic empowerment program to serve the city of Boston. It isn't enough to only have an equity program on a state level. Priority review should be extended from the initial city application to ISD application through the ZBA hearing to the final state license. Very good. Th thank you very much. So we're going to continue to go as quickly as we can. If you, anyone has written testimony, you can submit your written testimony. That will count as the same, and we'll make sure that all our co colleagues get it. We're now down to 42 seconds each. Go ahead. Hello. Good morning. My name is Sia Samora. I'm an economic empowerment applicant. I've been, I'm going ahead and trying to get licensed here for years. I just have a few things to say. Definitely the half mile buffer rule must go for economic empowerment applicants. The other thing I have to bring up here is is this the third year? The third year we've seen this Office of Small Business De Development come here, do the same old two-step hot shoe, not have no uh, accountability or obligations or responsibilities to anything. We've all been waiting for these folks to get in, to get, you know, in gear. And I've been coming to these folks for years. And if you want people to be encouraged to start businesses in the city of Boston, why don't you start? with this small business development office who really hasn't done anything. They have not been living up to what the department is supposed to be doing. And so this was really a shame right here. This is the third year in a row they've come and done basically the exact same thing. I don't know how we're going to inspire people to get into this business when this is what they're faced with. Um, get, let's get rid of the half mile buffer and support economic empowerment and social equity applicants. Thank you very Thank much you for very, this hearing. Thank you very much. Very succinct. If you can follow that, that'd be great. Um, Go ahead, how are you doing? I'm the uh, uh, owner of uh, High Tech Farms. My name is Chauncey Spencer. I'm going to submit my, um, my written app. Uh, awesome. Uh, uh, Thank you. However, I did want to take issue with um, something that was said regarding the the criteria for. Um, you speak closer to the mic. I did want to take issue oh, with some, some some of the description of the criteria set for uh, uh, judging um, uh, competing proposals, and I think I heard one of the uh, speakers say that they only consider. Uh, siting and I believe parking and traffic concerns. However, I do remember on the December 4th meeting that the criteria was actually supposed to, so, supposed to be siting, parking concerns, traffic, community feedback, equity designation, and also a diverse applicant team. And I don't know if that has been changed since then, but it would be very, very suspect. And I'm not, um, I don't know what you want to do in regards to that. I would think uh, changes like that don't allow businesses like myself to operate within an appropriate space, and that causes a, a whole host of problems. Now, maybe there was possible, maybe possibly there had been more uh, uh, criteria that, the, that were forgotten, but I hope that they, they weren't, because that is very critical to very our, our, our movement through the uh, process. And Thank we you. have been waiting since Great. May of uh, last year and we just recently had our outreach meeting. Um, so do you understand, we are economic empowerment applicant, and we were among the first to uh, submit our application. So I'm hoping that the, change, the rules have not been changed since then. And um, very good. Yeah, thank I will you. just submit my application. Very uh, good. Thank you very much. So we're now at 35 seconds each. We have to be cognizant. There's several more people. We have six minutes, and this is going to be a hard stop. We'll There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, so my name is Ross Bradshaw, and I basically just wanted to speak about two issues. One is transparency in the process that we saw today. There really is no transparency. Um, I am an economic empowerment applicant who applied in the Fenway neighborhood. I had community support from the business organizations, the resident organization, the community CDC, and I also had a site secured, and I also had a uh, member of my team who had owned or operated a business in the community for 50 years, and yet the committee or the city of Boston decided to go with another applicant that has three pending lawsuits, which was alluded to earlier, that include racism and potentially financial fraud, and yet they were awarded in the process over us. And the other aspect I want to talk about is the buffer zone. It has to go. I support this ordinance, but unless a buffer zone is addressed, this ordinance could actually hurt applicants by potentially having um, yeah, let's be false clear. opportunities. The, the buffer zone cannot be addressed in the ordinance. Thank you, Russ. So okay, just sure. because that's not how uh, buffer zones get changed, they're not going to get changed through the ordinance. But I. So All right, thank you. My, my name is Jared West. I'm the founder and partner of uh, One Shot Couriers, Inc. <clears throat> here in Boston. I'm going to be applying. I'm actually in the process of applying for a third-party transportation license, and I'm going to um, apply for a delivery license when it becomes available by the city and state. Uh, since we're here talking about equity of, uh, com for communities of colors that have been disproportionately affected by this, by the war on drugs, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, 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 I would like to uh, bring attention to the opportunity for employing residents from these areas, particularly those that were arrested and or incarcerated for uh, cannabis. In my view, they are the most qualified applicants that I would be looking to hire. 
Uh, therefore, I would request uh, to the council panel members that a program be implemented for networking and resources available to both qualified applicants and employers uh, looking to uh, participate. Thank you. Very Thank good. You. Thank you very much. You have the floor, sir. Go ahead. Uh, my name is Ethan Vogt. Uh, I'm a resident of Roxbury and founder of Homegrown Boston. Um, I think uh, this has probably been the most, uh, I've learned more in this hearing, uh, and I think it's been uh, thoughtful and practical in most ways, but I also think that it's indicated that Boston has not led uh, in this at all, and it's been an opaque process, and I guess um, it has favored the well-connected and the well-capitalized, and with my remaining 10 seconds, what I'd like to say is I suggest that the council um, suspend and nullify all the existing uh, host community agreements that the city has written. Uh, apparently, we've written about 20% of them, and they seem to have come from a corrupt system. I would be happy to talk directly about the reasons why I would suggest that. Thank awesome. You. Thank you very much. You have the floor, sir. Hi. My name is Reggie Stewart. I'm a Dorchester resident. Uh, I support uh, uh, the ordinance in part with a few caveats. Uh, in terms of the cannabis board, instead of uh, three members from the mayor and two from the council, I think it should be three from the council, two from the mayor, and one of those from the council do not have to be approved by the mayor. I, I think it should be a little closer to us uh, in terms of you all being more accountable to us. I think the mayor is a little too far away. I think it needs to be closer to the people. Uh, uh, the equity uh, applicant services, uh, I see where you say it may include, I think it must include, especially if we're talking about capital, because if we're talking about uh, African Americans, Latinos, but you know we've seen the numbers on net worth, capital has to be a part of that. Uh, I think in terms of the criteria, more should be uh, weighted uh, towards the equity applicant and also towards the ownership structure, uh, more cooperatives uh, for those, whether they're equity applicants or not, those that they hire, part of the benefits package should be some sort of, of profit sharing, which goes to uh, uh, the, the ownership question uh, to, to, to benefit. Uh, our communities. But that's Thank all you. I got to say Thanks. so far. Thank so you good. very much. Thanks. My name is Gabe Salazar. I'm the founder of We Can Deliver. And I'm here to say that this opportunity is only for us. It's for our families, for our community. I've seen firsthand, firsthand how being a positive beacon of light through living what we consider success can influence our community. When I was younger, I was in these streets. My community would see me being flying flashy. They wanted to be like me. So some of them chose to. It took a lot for my life to change. I got stabbed in my head three times, shot at, almost went to jail, while at the same time having a son and getting married. Uh, that's when I realized I needed to do better, and now that this has become legal, I can do better. I changed my surrounding, my, uh, around, I surrounded myself around mentors, I changed my environment, and that helped me not only value myself, however, it showed that by valuing myself, I can uplift others. Not everyone in my community has that opportunity. Though they witness the change, with this economic and social empowerment, they can witness people like me being successful and starting a business and giving positive impact to the community. So in turn, they can do the same. These big companies aren't us. They're not the community at large. We are. Allow us to be those beacon of lights and allow us, and I look forward to being of service to the city of Boston. Thank you. Well said. Thank you. You have the floor. Good afternoon. My name is Dawn Duncan. I work with Alchemy League, and I'm here today with the Marijuana Economic Empowerment Coalition, along with Narosmi August, uh, also with the my, uh, Marijuana Economic Empowerment Coalition. So we're a coalition that was formed approximately a month, month and a half ago, and have been working together to address issues affecting equity applicants. We include represent, representation from many individuals and small businesses that are that were impacted by the war on war on drugs. We're, our big concern is that many of our members are economic empowerment applicants. We were the very first businesses approved for priority review by the Cannabis Control Commission nearly a year ago, but we become painfully aware this priority review status is meaningless unless local municipalities prioritize equity. We want you all to know we do support um, Councillor Janey's recommendations, and you have them in emails we've sent to everyone, but Nerosmi wanted to add one other quick thing, sorry. Um, so we have a signature page that we're going to hand to you at the end. And also, um, something that, Kim, that you might think about is if, um, if we can have like a provisional license. So say we meet certain criteria, say uh, people who have economic empowerment applicants or our social equity, you know, maybe economic empowerment applicants have a provisional license that they can start with to help get um, funding 
um, to start and operate to cover some of the costs that's associated with um, with starting up. So, so we'll take a look at what you have. Okay, thank you. Make sure others have an opportunity. Here you go. AT Desa, Jason Kramer representing Greener Side Holdings, uh, economic empower, uh, excuse me, economic empowerment applicant. Uh, we're both Boston natives, South End and Roxbury. Uh, we want to go on record of supporting the uh, reduction or elimination of a buffer zone. I know that there's the ordinance has limited capacity to do that. Um, we also want to encourage the discussion on uh, how a buffer zones mono can uh, create monopoly, the comment that was made before, so I want to go on record of supporting that. Um, but the most important thing, I think, is to align what the zoning process is with the city's process, because on uh, Chief uh, on Mr. Barros's panel, I think there were uh, some, we, I can provide some written comment next time, but uh, uh, I think there were some inconsistencies being presented about how uh, the host agreement is, is, is offered. And for right now, I think the big thing is, in addition to the transparency, there really isn't a, there isn't criteria for any applicant. It just seems like there's, you know, it's a qualitative determination. So when it comes to economic empowerment applicants who are fighting for, uh, you know, a property in the same neighborhood, for instance, the applicant who is applying for property at 549 Columbus, we have proposed location at 552 Columbus, uh, right across the street. There doesn't seem to be a, uh, doesn't seem to be very clear how that, that determination is going to be made. And we want to put ourselves in the best position f to fairly and equitably uh, buy for that spot. So uh, thank you for that. Uh, did you have something to say? Oh, no. Thank you, guys. And we're big fans of the two for one ratio. We just think it'll um, spread the wealth out a little bit better and um, make it fair so there's not you know monopolies everywhere throughout our city. And the last public testimony, you have the floor. Hello, thank you for having me. My name is Albie Montgomery. I'm a resident of Roxbury, uh, and I do support Kim Janey's uh, ordinance. I'm actually an empower, uh, a economic empowerment certificate holder, and uh, some of my biggest barriers have been uh, the buffer zone, and I think something that's really nice that uh, Kim Janey mentioned earlier was the two for one every other once it's, you know, every other uh, license is actually an empowerment license. And I think that gives us some opportunity to make sure we have a fair chance in the game. Thank you. And thank, thank you, you Kim much. Janey, for everything you're doing for us. Thank Appreciate you. Thank you very much. So now we'll conclude the public testimony. I want to thank my colleague uh, and lead sponsor, Councilor Janey, as well as all of my colleagues for their patience, everyone's for your patience and time. I know that we went over time, um, but uh, with respect to uh, docket 0315, an ordinance establishing an equitable regulation of cannabis industry in Boston. The Committee on Government Operations will be adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.